Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm, week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and PRT director, and I'm joined as always by Scott Daly, probationary awards member. Scott, how are things going this week? Things are going great, Matt. I'm in my new studio, which I'm making quotes for because it's really just a room in my new house, but... Um... It was a rough week of moving, and uh, we took we took a week off and just answered some questions. But I am excited to be back and actually talk about Worm. Yeah, and this is an exciting arc we've got here. It um, is. Uh, we are covering Arc Nine Sentinel, which is a bit unusual. Yeah, that's right, Scott. Uh, this this arc is comprised entirely of interludes from the perspectives of the Brockton Bay wards. We get to see into the heads of some people who have been Taylor's adversaries. And we get to see the inner workings of the PRT on top of that. And maybe we gain just a little bit of sympathy for some characters that we may not have previously been fond of. (laughs) Maybe, Matt. Maybe. Uh, but first, we wanted to remind everyone that you, if you are listening to this via any kind of podcasting platform, um, please subscribe to the We've Got Worm podcasting feed. Um, this is the last episode we are going to post on the Daily Planet Films feed, so if that's the way you're listening to it, uh, if you want to hear this podcast going forward, you have to subscribe to We've Got Worm. Um, we've gotten a lot of people subscribed already. We've gotten a lot of reviews already. Um, so thank you for the people that have done that, but for the rest of you, please make that happen this week. Yeah, we really appreciate that. Uh, speaking of feeds, Scott, aren't you live tweeting your read through now? I am. I am. Uh, if you can, you can want to go to at got pod. You can keep up with my moment to moment reactions as I read through each arc. Um, I did that this week for arc nine and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that. Yep. And I'm definitely going to be tuning into that this coming week. Yes, but please don't uh, send me any spoilers as I'm reading. Um, I've had I had some people comment on my comments, um, and I liked that. Like that was cool. Interaction's fine, but please don't like like assume that I've reached a point of the chapter that I haven't yet or anything like that. So um, you can comment on only what I said directly, but don't go any further. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair. I think sometimes I've even messed up and assumed you read farther during the week than you had. But... Oh no, you're fine. All right. Good. Thank you for saying that, Scott. Okay. <laughs> um, so speaking of thoughts and reactions to Worm, um, actually, first, let's do our, our uh, discussion, comments, and questions. Um, we're we're going to be brief this week um, just because there's so much interaction in the threads now that we could spend an hour every week on the, on the comments. Yeah, plus we did this for a whole episode last week, so we answered yeah. a lot of questions. Yeah. So first, Captain Rhino asks, uh, what character are you most interested in seeing an interlude from? Um, as a perfect tie-in to our next question I see on this list, I really want to see Inside Alex Head a lot. Um, I hope that's coming up pretty soon here. I-, I feel like it will, just because there's so much about him we don't know, but that's really who I want to see. What about what about you? I guess you already know, but yeah, at this I, point, I, who do you think you would want to see? I mean... I, I didn't think about this ahead of time. I mean, I, I, I guess I agree with you there that it like it feels like Al- Alec has been set up to be, to be mysterious um, uh, at this point, and and you, you naturally want to know more about him. So that I think that's a that would have been my answer at this point in the in the story too. I think. Cool, cool. So speaking of the next question, King Bob Twelve asks some general questions about Alec. Um, re- regarding his behavior and the things he says, what is the, what is the truth about him, and what is a lie that he's telling, and what what are the parts of his personality where he's just in denial or he's exhibiting a coping mechanism that he's developed? Yeah, um, I think his past, most of the stuff he's said is probably true. Um, I think he's probably left some parts out, but that's lying by omission. Um, I think he's been honest with the things that happened to him. Um, I think he's not being honest that where, where he is lying is, um, his seeming indifference to it. Um, he doesn't seem like it really bothered him that much. It's, it's whatever. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't think someone can go through the things that he went through and not be affected by it in some way, um, internally. So I think that's, that's, and, and I agree with the question, I, King Bob, that that is a coping mechanism. If you divorce yourself from any emotion, you don't have to worry about it destroying you. Yeah, 
I think my memory is sufficiently bad that I can say this without it being a spoiler because I don't remember whether or not it's true. But um, I, I think maybe he's lying a bit when when he acts like, oh, yeah, I got away from my dad because he was cramping my style and it just wasn't fun anymore. Like, I think it's probably more like he was viscerally terrified of his dad due to all the abuse right. and emotional, you know, manipulation and everything. And but like you said, he kind of makes everything seem like no big deal by default. Yeah, and I think he seemed pretty indifferent to the fact that one day his dad could find him. Um, and and I think he's probably considerably more worried about that. Um, but I hope we do get to see inside his head soon, um, because I think Arc Nine's a really great example of how just how important um, diving into these characters and seeing from their point of view changes how you uh, think of them. Yeah. So we got the same set of questions about Lisa. Um, any, any thoughts about Lisa? Oh, boy. Um, I, I assume that everything that Lisa says is at least partially not true. <laughs> um, I know I've been ragged on before uh, in the comments for for my seemingly distrust of everything Lisa does and says. But um, I just, you know, she that's how she operates. And we have seen in her head now and we have seen that she uses misinformation and dishonesty um, and the things she does know to manipulate people. So. Um, I think, and and I, I agree that that is a coping mechanism as well. We don't know the truth of, of Lisa's past. We don't know her trigger event or anything yet, but, um, we can assume because helped by some of the stuff we learned in this chapter that her trigger event had something to do with intense mental stress, um, because they, they indicate that the type of power you gain has something to do with, uh, how you are at the time. So, uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think she has a rough background and she uses lies and deceit to kind of mask her true self. Um, and hopefully we see more about, of that, too. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I just said that that Alec is being painted as a mysterious character, but we actually know more about Alec than we know about Lisa because she's been very close to the chest with her um, with her backstory. Yeah. And even when we were when we were in her head, we didn't see much. And I think that's that's key to how Lisa operates, because she seems like a character who's forthcoming. Um, because she talks a lot and she shares a lot, but it's, it's always like, like it's not, she's not actually saying things or telling you things about her when she's doing it. She's just making you think she is. Um, mm. so you, you think you're getting to know her, you think you're getting to understand her, but how much are you really? You're interesting, Scott. I'll have to pay more attention to that. I think you're right though. <laughs> so finally, uh, Wild Bo wrote yet another fascinating post about his, his educational background, what he studied in school, and uh, what that might have to do with how he wrote Worm. I'm not even going to try to summarize it because it, it was fairly long and also fairly dense. I recommend you just go read it if you're interested in understanding more about his process. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't word it better than he did. So yeah, just, I, just go check that out. I love this every week. Um, I, I, his his posts are kind of like companions to our podcast now, and I think okay. they really elevate what we do to the next level um because mm -hmm. he like it's we share our insights and our um glowing reviews of this work and then he comes in and explains in a little more detail um how he did things and it and i know we've said this before but it is so cool to get to uh, interact with the author of a work as we sit here and, and discuss it each week um so i'm really thankful for him for doing that and i hope everyone out there is enjoying his posts as much as we are yeah. Oh, yeah. I definitely really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah. And then uh, there was a lot of generally interesting commentary in the thread about how people visualize things based on what they're reading um, or fail to visualize things, as the case may be. And that was based on our discussion last week about costumes and, and visualizing them. Um, I think there's kind of a variety of how people how people visualize the things that they're reading. And that doesn't surprise me, actually. It's just I, I still don't know where I fall on that spectrum, which is interesting. Yeah, I was surprised at how many people agreed with the way that I read. I kind of I always felt like this was a, a deficiency in my reading process that I could never like fully absorb the visual descriptions of people. But there's way more people out there that experience the same thing and i just that was comforting for me as a, a person um so yeah it's it's really cool i'd love to study this further to sit down and and really study the different ways people approach literature as they read it um i think that'd be fascinating yeah i agree all right scott let's move straight on into the beat by beat uh commentary 
Um, so yeah, this is, um, but bef actually before, before we move into it, let's just make some general comments about this, this arc, because it is unusual. And I think it, it, it has a, some definite themes to it and it's very different because it's different points of view. So maybe it takes a little bit more, um, effort to point out those themes. Uh, so did you have some, some opening comments? Yeah. Um, I really loved this arc. Um, it, it, it feels like we talked about how arc eight was the end of book one of worm. This feels like book one epilogue. Um, and it's, it's, but it like feels so important. We're not with Taylor at all really throughout this entire arc, but it is it just feels so important to the story. And this might be kind of a bold statement, but I really think I enjoyed reading this arc the most so far. Um, I think this is my favorite so far. Um, uh, it didn't have as much of the action as, as arc eight have. Um, I really did miss seeing Taylor, um, but really diving into these different personalities and switching them up each chapter was, um, was so much fun. And the whole arc is like a testament toward how you can see things from a different point of view and how those different point of views can change your mindset on things and can change your opinions on things. Even from, from like paragraph to paragraph, almost like we jump from how we see a person from clock blocker's point of view to how we see them from Vista's point of view. And, and that not only is it different and noticeably different, but it changes our opinion as well. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Another thing that that I like to point out about this arc that may have been part of the reason why it was so appealing to you was that I think it has really incredible narrative economy, uh, and and by that I mean um, a huge amount of of very detailed character interactions and and evolutions of of dynamics between characters occur in what is really a, a very short amount of page space. Um, I wouldn't say that the rest of Worm doesn't have narrative economy, but this this arc has really spectacular narrative economy to it. Yeah, I completely agree, because we have five different characters that we have to get to know over the course of um, the amount of words that we would have used to get to know one character. Um, we've, mm -hmm. been, we've been with Taylor for almost, God, is it 200-something thousand words now? Um, and by the end of this arc, I really feel like I have a really good grip of who these six people are. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it is that narrative economy it is the fact that I'm nerding out about, um, how much wild is kind of challenging himself with this, that he's hopping styles of writing each chapter and he's telling things from a different point of view and, and the narration matches that point of view. It's really impressive. Um, from just a technical aspect, it's impressive structurally cause it's telling one story, but we're switching perspective each time. Um, it's just, it's really good. It's really yeah. good. And it's greatly broadening the world that you live in or that, that you know, that, that you feel like you're living in, in the story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's open it up. Um, chapter 9.1, Weld is our point of view character. So newcomer Weld arrives by a plane. He's a case 53 with metallic skin and he navigates the Brockton Bay airport, noting that it's very vacant uh, and he's picked up by director Pigo in a helicopter. Um, just some, some general notes as he's moving through the airport, he's kind of being very careful not to touch things because he becomes stuck to any metal he touches, which proves a constant inconvenience to him. Yeah. I'm going to kind of use like, as we finish each chapter, I'm going to use that opportunity as like a chance to tell you my overall feelings on the character. But, um, I love just the confidence with how this chapter and this arc starts off. Um, I noticed in the table of contents, it specifies arc nine as Ward's interlude arc, quote unquote. Um, I'm kind of curious how th that information was communicated, like as the story was being released. Um, because if you just are going by the next chapter thing without looking through the, the table of contents, it just drops you into 9.1 and you have to like f experience fully um, how like how. Uh, different this point of view is so mm -hmm. um it's it's just really it's just really cool mm -hmm. yeah yeah that makes sense so uh pigo is giving him the rundown of of the city in uh in the helicopter so basically you know cliff's notes things are bad the unemployment and, and crime rate is is you know astronomically high much of the city has been destroyed by the by the tsunamis um, it's pretty dystopian and, and terrible. 
um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could call it, like, it's kind of the aftermath, right? Um, mm. These six chapters are just us observing the consequence of the attack, and it, it is. It's absolutely devastating. And, um, it, like, we've been getting these hints that Brockton Bay has been kind of primed to fall for a while now, and this attack just feels like it just pushed it over the edge, and that mm. the city might just never be able to recover from this. Yeah, yeah, and we, we might hear that sentiment in a little bit. Um, so we learn at this point from Pigot that Weld is here to take command of the wards since Aegis and the assumed, you know, second in line for command Gallant are both dead now. Yeah, so we missed Aegis, I think, when we read the eulogy because um, something I didn't realize at the time actually was that Taylor only read like part of the names because she never looked at certain sides of the monument. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't actually read all the names when we did that, but... Um, yeah, this gives us like a really good sense of how weak the wards are. They have like four people now, um, mm -hmm. and one of them is Kidwin, so like three and a half people. <laughs> oh, Scott. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if you still feel that way when we get to the end. I know. I know. Okay, so um, here follows in their conversation, or rather in Weld's train of thought, the most delightful integration of setting information to date. So Weld is given some files on heroes and villains in that area, and he mentally recites the full list of power classifications. And we've never, we haven't heard the full list up until now. And of course, the list goes mover, shaker, brute and breaker, master, tinker, blaster and thinker, striker, changer, trump and stranger. So Scott, we have a clear idea on what a lot of these are at this point. Um, but do you care to guess at the ones that you're less clear on? Um... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try. But um, I really want to just say first how much I like these. Um, I think this is really clever. And I really like how the information was fed to us. Like we got a hint of these in the middle of this huge, big uh, rising action. Um, but we didn't really have time to go into them in a lot of detail because things were happening and they were more important. But now the story has slowed down a bit. The pace has slowed down and we have time to stop and actually explain to us what these things mean. Mm -hmm. Um, and so while Bono has time to feed this information to us and I just really like how that's done. Um, yeah, you, I think you're right that I have a pretty, some of them are pretty self-explanatory. Some of them have been specifically explained to us before. Um, the two I'm really not sure on are the last two Trump and stranger. Um, I don't think we, we've probably seen people with those classifications, but I don't know if, uh, they're necessarily, um, uh, like easy to understand just from those names. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, um, I did, I did just want to add one more thing. Um, okay. that just that like, I, I love the detail that they were originally made to label the villains. Um, but then just became a natural way to discuss and label all capes because it's like very human to like say, okay, we have this thing. We need to segment it off. We need to classify it. We need to label it. Um, I really love that. And I love how that ties into Weld and this, this character detail of him not liking be called a brute. Um, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just like in the middle of this exposition, we get this little tiny character trait about this big metal man, um, who I would, I would think brute would be a perfect way to describe him, but Weld sees himself as, as more than that. Um, and it's just, it really is this wonderful way of doing exposition correctly because this is a big, long info dump, but when you mix in these character beats, it makes you like care more about the information. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Weld is a very interesting character. And I think that is a great little piece of information about him. We're going to get, going to get a lot of information. It, it's, it's interesting. Cause I think, isn't he the second of the case 53s that we've had a, a point of view? Yeah. I think Gregor was the first and he's yeah. the second and they are two very, very different. So as far as how the 53s are related, um, it seems like not very much right now, besides the fact that they look different. Right. I mean, they, they, ha they both seem to have fairly different attitudes toward their monstrosity. Um, Gregor is someone who, who knows that he's hideous and that no one wants to look at him or interact with him. And Weld is actually like a fan favorite and, and people love him. And it's not that he's like handsome per se, but he's, he's monstrous in a way that's actually appealing, which is, which is very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's another, uh, just as a tidbit for later, it's mentioned that there's a potential recruit in town for Weld to look into a, a, a tinker slash mover. 
Yeah, and that's the one thing that I'm going to probably bug you on when we get to it is how these like sub classifications work and how that's decided. Um, the tinker mover in this case kind of confuses me a little bit, but we'll save that for uh, okay. for when we get there. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and then, of course, we're reminded in context of the conversation that Velocity, who was a protectorate member, also died, and that Arms Master, um, who was you know the leader, is retired, and that or at least that's how they're spinning it. Does, does it surprise you that they're choosing to spin it that way? Nope. Remember last week, and I said I don't think that he would actually end up in prison. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not surprised in the slightest. Um, and I really am seeing an interesting parallel here between like heroes and villains and the classes of rich and poor. Um, and following through on that that metaphor, there's no way a guy as rich or heroic, quote unquote, as arms master would ever go to jail. Um, but I do think you're right that the retirement is probably a, a spin on that. Um, my guess is he's like being closely watched by the protectorate um, in some form or fashion. Um, I think a really fitting way to complete that whole rich poor metaphor would be have him under like some sort of bullshit house arrest in his giant mansion somewhere um, where yeah. he's he's being watched on house arrest, but really just getting to do whatever he wants. Interesting. Is that a prediction, Scott? I, I guess so. All right. <laughs> See, I think the the line between predictions and formal predictions and me just talking out of my ass while we're recording is 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 shrinking each day. Yeah, that's fine though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so also Cape uh Fleshette. I never say it no if it's Fletchette or Fleshette. I think it's Fleshette. I think that sounds way fancier and therefore yeah. I like it. Very well. We'll go with that. Fleshette will be arriving from New York uh to help bolster the ranks. Well mentions that he and Flechette know each other and they have a friendly rivalry and Pigot manages to have no tact or humor or human understanding in her response to this information. God, she's the worst, isn't it? Like, she's awful. And I think yeah. that, that kind of ties into one of the sub themes of this arc, which is that being a good guy really sucks <laughs> because yeah. you have to work for this terrible, annoying person. Like they mentioned over and over again, the paperwork you have to do. Um, like it seems like you are not allowed to have fun at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I want to change my answer as to whose head I want to see into because, you know, Pigo seems so like genuinely inhuman, but like clearly every wild bow character is a human. Um, you know, with, with, their own actual motivations for why they behave the, the way they behave. So I want to, I want to know who Pigo is. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting thing I hadn't thought of um, because it seems like everyone has stuff behind them. Once you get in your head, you start to sympathize with them more. So is it possible to make you like Piggy? I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Or maybe we won't. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Very um, smooth. <laughs> So uh, so we start hearing the power classifications for the wards to get us calibrated. That's how I think of it, is we're getting calibrated on what these power levels mean. Clockblocker is a Striker 7. Vista is a Shaker 9. Kidwin is a Tinker 4. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Uh, Shadowstalker is a Breaker 3 with sublabels Stranger 2 and Mover 1. Um, so, Scott, let's talk about this system and its, and its utility a little bit. Okay, so this is one of the questions I have. So... With when you have multiple classifications like Shadowstalker does, um, mm -hmm. do you have like an overall level? Like if she's a breaker three, stranger two, mover one, is she like considered more powerful than Kid Win at just Tinker Four? Or I mean that's that's one of the things I don't fully understand. And maybe I'm not supposed to, maybe I'm just getting ahead of myself, but Yeah, I'd say I I mean you're 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 probably not supposed to at this point. Um I'm going to try to phrase this in a way where I'm not giving you like information that you shouldn't know or that would ruin something for you. But like my, my interpretation there, and I'm kind of making this up also is that like what she really is, is a stranger to slash mover one, but the way she accomplishes being those two things is via a breaker power. Um, I don't know if that clarifies anything for you at all. I think maybe the, the other yes. example of, of the, of the tinker, slash mover would be that the main thing is that he's a mover like if you're if you're fighting him the main thing is that he moves around really fast the main thing isn't that he's a tinker because he does all of his tinkering in private like you know 
completely separate from the battle. But it may be important for you to understand, okay, well, his his speed is achieved through the basis of, of his machinery that he builds. Um, and yeah. fundamentally, this is all just information that's being given to people so that they know what they're going to be dealing with. Yeah, and see, that's where it starts to confuse me, though, because, like, with Chariot, for example, who's who's the tinker mover we're talking about, he's a mover because he builds things that make him move fast. But if the things make him move faster, does that make his tinker number go up or his mover number go up or both? And why or why not? Like, that's... <laughs> and it may, I'm probably just overthinking this kind of thing, mm. but um, it's just... It's just it causes a lot of questions in my head. Yeah, I think I think the way the numbers work is is actually very well. It's like it's very concrete. So um, you you won't necessarily find out what the numbers mean in the text specifically. Um, like in terms of like this is what a four means. This is what a five means. This is what a six means. Mm-hmm. But it, um, but they are. I, I think they are very well established. Um, okay. trying to dan- I'm, I'm dancing around saying all of this is very <laughs> de- detailed documentation in the in the tabletop role playing game that has been made based on Worm. Oh, holy shit! I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, that's another one of those things where I'm like, is this a spoiler? I don't know how to deal with this information. But yes, there is a tabletop. I don't. I don't know that game. a game exists counts as a spoiler. I think details right. on the game that existing counts as a spoiler. Yes. Well. I'm not going to talk about the details of the game other than to say that <laughs> right. the, supplement, the supplementary materials explain the power classifications in a way that answers your questions. I will say this is very cool. I like this idea. I like the technical nature behind it. Um, I think that it's funny because I've been watching... I watch a lot of superhero stuff. I watch a lot, a lot of the DC comic shows. I saw Guardians of the Galaxy this past weekend, and I've been looking at this stuff with a worm in my head, and I've been like... Thinking as I watch stuff, yeah, Worm would explain that better. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like it's not that this other things I ruined to me. Like I really still like watching The Flash. I really still like watching Supergirl. I thought Guardians Two was great, but it's it does show how we're kind of playing in a whole different genre almost mm-hmm. um, from these other things because Worm is so much more interested in the detail of the stuff than these other stories are. Yeah, I mean, basically the way I finally got you to read this was by every time we talked about a superhero movie, I would like sigh heavily <laughs> and, and like and like be visibly restraining myself from talking about Worm in some way and then eventually fail to restrain myself and just talk about how Worm would have done this differently. Yeah, um, if, if you listeners are going back and listening to some of our old podcasts, there are moments when there's this long pause and then you hear Matt say, well, in Worm... <laughs> <laughs> And then we go on a five minute tangent. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like I said, I'm not enjoying these other properties less. I just appreciate the difference here. And I appreciate that this story wants to go into the details. And more importantly, that it makes those details interesting and part of the narrative. Yeah. I agree. All right, Scott, it's time to play Guess the Cape. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, I'm so excited. What do so I win? We don't know. So, so, so Pigo is going through the, these folders and handing them to Weld, and Weld is basically looking over the cape power levels. And in some cases, we learn who has what power level, but in many cases, we just hear the power level. So, Scott, the game is that you're going to guess who the capes are based on hearing their power levels. So, first of all, we don't know who the merchants. Or we don't know the merchants very well. We saw them briefly at the Somers Rock Bar meeting, but like you didn't see their powers. You didn't. The, the powers weren't described. You don't really know anything about them. Uh, but they seem to have low power levels, and they are the parahuman leaders of the dregs of society. And, and they have seized a large amount of territory in the wake of the tsunamis, even though their power levels seem low. Yeah, so they, I mean, I feel like we're setting up a long-term villain here, or a villain group that's going to be plaguing our main characters for a while. Um, so I'm fine staying away from speculating on these guys until we know anything about them. Because honestly, I had forgotten that we met them in the bar. <laughs> I don't remember yeah. that, so... Yeah, we don't. We just don't learn much. Yeah, all, all that happens is um, Kaiser just like talks down to them, and, and then they leave the table. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so Empire eighty eight has apparently broken up into two factions called Fenrir's Chosen and the Pure, and I think we can guess who is leading which branch. Yeah. Well, they also tell us that. 
Yes. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, so <laughs> we're, we're given freebies that Hook Wolf is a Shaper 4, Brute 7, and Purity is a Blaster 8, Mover 4. The thing I like most about this detail is we've seen how powerful these two people are. Um, our characters have basically fought them and lost. And we just also learned that Vista is a, is a, a Shaker 9. So, like, right. how much powerful she is potentially than these two. That's kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of what she can do all out. Yeah. So in the pure, there's also a Breaker 9, a Shifter 8 slash Stranger 3, and a Master 6. So who is who? Oh, boy. Um. So I remember specifically they told us that Crusader, Knight, and Fog were Purity's underlings that left um empire 88 when she did and only came back when she did so i'm guessing these are these three but i thought they said that knight had died in the battle with leviathan maybe maybe knight just got hurt um i don't know i don't remember I think, yeah i think it was knight down not not knight deceased but I, okay. I may be misremembering yeah you might be right okay so i'm just gonna assume the knight is still part of this and therefore i'm gonna say uh crusader is the master six Is that is that right? I think so. <laughs> you think you don't know? <laughs> I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, so I think the, the whole thing with breakers is that they can alter themselves right, and fog turns into fog. So I'm going to say he's the breaker. Um, which means knight is the shifter eight, and I still don't really understand what a stranger is, and this doesn't really help me with that. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I suppose I could go consult the wiki, but I'm I'm pretty confident that that's right. Look at me. I'm three for three. Yeah. That right. All right. So the Undersiders are, are, are a villain gang in Brockton Bay. I haven't heard of them. Who are they? Yeah. They're they're kind of minor. Um, there's three masters in one team and only one of whom is of any particular concern. Who are these masters? Oh, I, I know. Um, there's Skitter and then <laughs> there's Bitch. And then there's Regent. I'm That's thinking, right, Scott. Again, thinking, yeah. Um, and I, I feel like the only one of whom is any particular concern is like designed for us to immediately think of Taylor. Um, but that's what makes me think maybe it's a little misleading. Um, so I'm not sure we're, whether that's actually Taylor or not. I think it'd be much more interesting if it's Regent, who we know so little about. Um, also, they also mentioned that two of the members have signs of sociopathy, <laughs> which is very interesting. Um, yeah. They don't specify which ones. Um, it could be a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, even based on how we see Taylor behaving from the outside later on. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and before you even ask the question, I'm going to say Tattletail is a thinker um, based mm -hmm. on what I know. And I have no idea what Gru would be. Um, I'm going to say Stranger because that seems like the only one that it would fit into and i still don't understand what it means yeah just just to tease you he probably qualifies as partially a stranger i don't know i don't know what that means well mm. i'll never know scott <laughs> um so fault lines crew has mostly low ratings except for a shaker 12 who's that yeah, so when I was going back to read and I saw you wrote this, I did not know at all. And then I reread and they kind of give you a pretty big hint who it is because they specifically say the Shaker 12 is like messed up mentally. So mm -hmm. it's Labyrinth, um, which is crazy. Um, like uh, judging by how they react to nines, like a 12 just seems like the strongest tornado or hurricane or earthquake ever or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, I, I mean, and when you when you think about what she can do, like we don't even understand the limits of what she can do or what she's doing exactly, but it's uh, yeah, it it must be pretty amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think uh, in 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 the midst of all this, they mentioned that the the um, the travelers have really high ratings, um, but they don't really go into what those are. So I guess we'll just pass over those guys. Um, yeah, I could guess, but I don't want to look stupid. Yeah, I mean it's it's harder it's harder to take a power and classify it than it is to to guess the way we've been. That's guessing. true. That's true. So it turns out. Uh, so yes, that that has been our session of guess the cape.
I win a podcast. You see, you yeah. Here's your here's your trophy. <laughs> it's it's a lump of Weld's flesh. That's it's really gross. <laughs> well, it's metal, Scott. So, speaking of which, Weld will be expected to attend high school full time apparently, and he doesn't need to sleep much, so he should have no trouble doing that. In addition to being the captain of the wards. Uh, he'll be living at the ward's headquarters, um, seeing as he doesn't have a family, being a case 53. And we also learned just kind of offhandedly the detail that he had been found originally dumped in a junkyard. Yeah, um, and we'll get into this at the end of the chapter, but Weld is really fascinating to me. And I think, as I mentioned at the top, he's one, uh, besides Kid Wynn, that kind of is at the most mercy of the different points of view thing we see in this arc um especially when you see this section compared to how he's viewed in clock clock blocker section which we get to um but like the big thing to me overall is this is the this is the first time we're getting this much time in the head of someone on this good guy team and how like just decent of a person he seems um and this is kind of compounded by that terrible background story we just learned about him um, and he gets a lot of shit thrown at him during the course of this whole arc, but he just seems to like take it in stride and he's just trying to be the best person he can be. And he's really cool. Yeah. I mean, he, he almost seems like the candidate for the genuinely good person award that was discussed during the mailbag episode. Yeah. I think that's, that's fair. At least uh, what we know of him right yeah. now. Right. So an interesting quirk of his power is that he counts as organic to powers that affect only inorganic things, and he counts as inorganic to powers that only affect organic things, so he kind of won the lottery as far as the Manton effect is concerned. If by won a lottery, you mean he was created in a lab to be perfect and do that on purpose. Hmm. Is that speculation? I don't, I don't even know anymore. I think so. I just, I'm, <laughs> just, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just penciling in every other thing you say as a speculation. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to grade you on it. All right. So Pigo steers the conversation toward explaining why Weld is being put in a leadership position. And he already knows, actually, but he lets her explain anyway to see how she couches it. So Weld is being groomed to take a bigger role in the protectorate as a friendly, likable face, a PR poster boy. Pigo manages to rag on Weld's mentor, Director Armstrong, in the course of her explanation. And Weld feels obligated to defend him. Um, so anyway, Weld is going to, you know, he's being groomed to be a member of the, of the core protector team, which we don't know what that means exactly, but it sounds like a big deal, within three to five years. Yeah, this is kind of that story economy you were talking about earlier. Um, this is a bunch of exposition on how the protector, it seems to run, and it kind of recontextualizes how this organization works for us. But at the same time, it's also doing this um, character defining stuff in the middle of it, like the fact that he lets her talk, even though he knows um, what she's going to say anyway, um, the fact that he defends his previous director and mentor, um, even in front of his new boss. Um, and, and like, it, he just like all this stuff just builds this image of him, um, that of this just good, like we said, decent already, but just this good guy that he takes his job very seriously. He, he treats those well that treat him well. Um, and, um, it's just, I, I just love it. I love this little information we get mixed in here. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we haven't really spent that much, you know, page space with Weld yet. And we already feel like we know him really well and, and we like yeah. him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, so overall, like you were saying, in terms of, of learning more about the PRT, we learned that a big part of the protectorate as an organization seems to be focused on PR finding likable personalities, doing merchandising, TV shows, movies, lunchboxes, um, and developing law and policy to build confidence in heroes. Um, yeah, it's, we can certainly speculate as to how the canary thing plays into that. So the, the next step in the you know plan of the protectorate is to normalize parahumans by promoting the existence of rogues who are basically non-aligned parahumans, not not villain and not hero either. Yeah, and I love this idea because I think this is a really well-meaning goal. Um, I think they've looked at it pragmatically and said the number of parahumans is not going to decrease over time. Most likely it will increase, increase, and the best way to live is peaceful coexistence. Um, but we've seen kind of the negative effects of that normalization process already, right? You mentioned Canary's imprisonment. Um, 
if we want to normalize, we have to reduce people's general fear. To reduce that general fear, we have to make sure that, that capes are kept in line. And we do that by making example out of people and terrorizing them into being afraid to use their powers. Um, and I love this idea how this this kind of ties into what Coil wants to do, although from a different angle. Um, this this idea that the ends justify the means and that, you know, people can be used and then thrown away um, as long as it's for the, the greater good. Um, the greater good. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hot fuzz reference for all those out there. Um, like, Canary was sacrificed for this. Um, and, and to carry that even further, Weld is just being used as a tool. That's a, that's a pun, because he's metal. <laughs> um, he is being used as a tool for the Protectorate, and, and he's being used as a mean to an end, and there's this coldness to it. There's just this lack of humanity and real concern for the individual. Um, and it ties into this whole anti-authority thing that we've been seeing so far. It's this, the, 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 author, the people in charge are willing to overlook the mistreatment of a few to maintain stability, and that's like the thing that Taylor's been pushing against this entire story. Yeah. Um, so, like... On the one hand, we learn things about this noble goal, but we see the bad side of it, too. Yeah, I guess that that, that may give a bit of insight into why Pigo is is the way she is, is, is that like she kind of as part of her role, she has to view the capes as semi expendable, semi interchangeable, like parts of the plan. And, you know, from her point of view, she like several of her cape employees were just brutally killed. And now Weld is coming in and it, there's got to be it, maybe this isn't the first time that's happened. You know, we don't we don't quite know how common violence is and how common death is in yeah. this world. But we get the sense that, like, after a few iterations of your whole team, like being cycled through in the course of kaiju violence, you're just going to kind of turn off to the whole the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good point. And now I'm really more interested in seeing inside her head. Yeah. That that genuinely was kind of speculation. I'm not I'm not cheating there. So yeah. So so Weld um he requests permission to do some team building and training exercises before Pigo leaves, and Pigo pushes back a bit and mentions that the wards will have to do that on top of their existing duties, but she ultimately relents and says he can he can try that. Yeah. This this kind of felt a little weird to me. I mean, I know we're really, like really trying to sell this idea of Pigo as like a total jerk. But like to be resistant to more training seems a little strange. Um, I don't know. Did you feel that way at all? Or yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely hear your hear your your objection there. Um, I th I think basically it's it's the idea. I, I, I don't know. That's it is really interesting to think about because it's like on, on the one hand you would think that like as a bureaucrat she wants like oh of course more training more standardization, but on the other hand her being against the training uh, emphasizes the flip side that we were just talking about actually where she, she she almost she almost may be seeing the wards as so expendable and interchangeable that she's like why bother yeah yeah <laughs> why I bother think, training them? I, I don't know I don't know I think that's a really good point I didn't think of that. Um, either way, it's kind of all worth it for this one exchange between the two of them near the end of their conversation where, where Weld says, I'm totally prepared to eat any and all paperwork on our end. And her response is, eat the paperwork? And he's just like, I mean, I'll do it all. It's just, yeah. I, I laughed out loud. That's yeah. Pigo's like total lack of humanity. She can't even understand the expressions. Yeah. The, for some reason that reminded me, um, how much I have been enjoying the worm audio book um, because they, they do a really fantastic job on, on the readings um, and in the dialogue and stuff like, and as you were reading that, I was like, I was remembering how hilarious that was to hear it read on the worm audio book. So I'm just plugging that. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Just, that, it, I, I've really enjoyed it too. Um, they've, they, at some point they really found their groove with that. Um, and it, it's gotten really good. Yeah. And, and, it, and it helps us with, the, with our project because it allows us to kind of, go through the story quickly uh, to, to or me at least go through it quickly again to get, to get a mental map of what's important. And then I, and then when I go through the second time and make my notes, it's, it's more clear. So thanks yep. Worm audiobook project. Yep. So Weld heads into the, the HQ to meet the wards and he enters their kind of basic break room, common room area or whatever. And he looks over 
the wards. And here we get a more human, less tactical look at the characters we'll be spending the next few chapters with. We met them before in the earlier wards interlude, but this is a welcome outsider perspective. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right here. It serves as almost like a reintroduction, um, so much so that we get a description of what they look like again and their costumes, which is helpful for people like me who can never remember costumes. Um, I remember that Clockblocker has a clock on his costume now. That's the best I got. There's a clock on there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, and, and there is a real sense of like, understandable hostility there's this outsider nature to it the door opens and everyone's staring at him and he doesn't really know what to do um it's a really good way to set the stage yeah yeah absolutely um so yeah so like you said all the wards are pretty skeptical and and closed to his presence in general and as he begins to introduce himself and kind of do his intro sales pitch clock blocker quickly interrupts him uh when he mentions training and just kind of basically rants about some of the ongoing horrors in the city. Yeah, um, there's a lot of well-meaning here on, Bahard, on, on Weld's behalf, but I, I kind of am with Clockblocker on this. Um, it really was, like, he needs to learn to read the room a little bit, and, um, it, like, throughout... The, the, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is how often throughout all these exchanges, like, we see little hints about how bad it is in the city right now. Like the airport's totally empty. Like there's a random f car fire that starts. Like there's one point where he walks outside and like, there's just someone cackling in the background. Right. Um, <laughs> and like, and like, and now like Clockblocker like lays out the specifics of some of the stuff they've encountered. Like it's absolute chaos. And Weld just seems like he's like aware of it and he sees it, but he, he doesn't really get it. Um, yeah. it's like, he's making calculated decisions and he's nervous about how he'll fit in with the group, but he's like, he's almost more like Pigo where he's kind of removed from that damage and destruction. He hasn't really lived in it yet. Um, and that kind of comes off in how he in attempts to win these guys over, like starts talking about training when he can see that they're like in really rough shape. Yeah. I don't think it's still sunk in for him that this is basically a disaster area and not even like a functional city anymore. Yeah. And on top of that, I don't know if he's absorbed the fact that this is their city and, and they're all basically traumatized and and like shell shocked from what happened. Um, and, and I mean, he's he's doing remarkably well for we don't actually know how old he is because I don't know if he knows how old he is. But someone who at the very least has very little amount of actual memory because all the case 53s had no memory of who they were before. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you could have done a better job by thinking, thinking about it a little differently. That's, that's, that's certainly true. Um, and then, yeah, so shadow stalker voices, the idea that things might never get better. Yeah. And as optimistic as I try to be, I'm kind of on her side with this too. I mean, we've just seen like the city has been limping along for a while and now it just got its legs chopped off. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's basically arc by arc it's been getting worse right yeah and and it's culminated in the in the tsunamis and the and the flooding and giant lakes and everything yeah yeah so overall it goes pretty poorly for weld and the wards all disperse to go about their duties uh, vista kind of tries to open up to him but then ends up giving him a hard time for failing to acknowledge the dead people he's replacing yeah and this is this is where we leave weld and it's such a perfect place because like I, I love this guy. I love him so much. He's really fascinating. And he's like, he's so well-meaning, um, but he just oh, doesn't always think things through. Like, he, he doesn't see the trees for the forest. He's too busy looking at the big picture um, without really th thinking about the individuals and how they are involved. Um, and like, he, he understands that the wards might not want a new leader, but he doesn't fully understand why that is it's because their last leader died um right. and and he just like he can't and it's it's not like he's not trying he is trying and he understands like almost immediately that he screwed up but um he just it's always in retrospect and i think we see him even though we leave him from the point of view at this point we do see him grow and gain confidence as a leader and a human over the course of this arc yeah, that's that's one thing I really like is sometimes like a, an arc will be started inside one character's head, but then it'll be finished from another character's point of view. Um, that's yet another example of the story economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so you remember just just to point it out that Weld was the guy who gave Taylor the comradely clap on the shoulder before the Leviathan fight. See, I didn't actually remember that that was him. Um, but now I love him even more because yeah, that, it, that's awesome. Yeah, it was just it was that he was I think he's from Boston. So it was he was with the Boston Capes and he has metal skin. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that makes sense. But I didn't catch on to that. Yeah. Yeah. So so we move on from Weld to Flechette, who, you know, it, it's another interesting thing here is that the, 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 the chronology is actually very tight in this chapter. So this is pretty shortly after Flechette has left that meeting with Weld. Um, she's, she is a newcomer. She's another newcomer to Brockton Bay. She's, you know, the, the, the guy who, or rather the gal who um, Weld was talking about earlier in the helicopter. So she sneaks, she accidentally sneaks up on Shadowstalker uh, on a rooftop and almost gets shot in the face. And she actually catches one of the crossbow bolts out of the air, which for some reason my brain failed to like read that for the first read through and maybe even the second read through, but that's kind of awesome. Yeah. Maybe you're not as good as catching things as she is. <laughs> this is a terrible joke. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, <laughs> I deserve um, that. <laughs> um, I, I do really love how this chapter opens, though. I, like, it, again, economy of character development. Like, we see Flechette try to give this, like, quippy line. Um, she says something like, man, it was hard to track you down. And, like, she mm. doesn't even get into it before she gets a crossbow <laughs> bolt shot at her face. Yeah. Um, and it just, like, it defines that dynamic between the two of them, where it, Flechette is this, like, nice, like, like kind of a little bit, a little bit posturing type of, but, but compassionate hero where, where shadow stalker is this no nonsense. Don't screw with me type of person. And that's all told in that one simple interaction. And I think that's just so smart and clever. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it, it definitely sets the tone going forward. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny cause shadow stalker spends maybe the first like five minutes trying to be on, on good behavior. Cause she's like, she's like, yeah, I don't, I don't do backup, but yeah, you can come with me. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to be running ahead though. And then I'll just like loop back and check on you every once in a while. So yeah, th- you, you have the sense that like, this is actually shadow stalker trying really hard to behave, even though she's still not actually being nice. Um, so yeah, shadow stalker goes ahead on, on the patrol. She uses her, basically her permeability to all obstacles to just kind of zoom forward really quickly. Um, so basically she's, she's weightless and she can pass through things. So she can obviously cover a lot of ground. And Flechette, she can use her power to cover a lot of ground too, but it's a lot more effortful for her. So basically she uses her power to make the needles fired by her crossbow fly straighter and bite more deeply into buildings. And she can use the same power on her cleats to dig into and run up the sides of, of buildings. Um, she has like a device that makes an infinite amount of chain uh, for her grappling you know, device. So I guess she just ends up leaving a massive chain and, and crossbow bolts all around the city, it looks like. <laughs> That'd be so annoying. Um, yeah, right. It's it's like worse than Spider-Man. Um, so her basic power is apparently to charge things so that they can shrug off various laws of physics. And uh, speaking to that, recall from last week that Flechette was the cape shooting the needles that went through Leviathan. Yeah, and I really love the comparison between these two characters, right? Um and how they interact with each other here and how they just just this the the physical nature of how they leap across these buildings is like a perfect comparison for who they are because shadow stalker is this person that like floats easily along the rooftops and is kind of above everything where like every move seems like a chore for flechette like the, the story takes time to explain as she makes each movement and like how much she has to do just to get from one building to another um, and like, she's constantly mixing her power and these tools and like it, it, it just really, it really defines them. Like shadow stalker is this person that's kind of out of sync with the world and feels above it all. Flechette, uh, like is kind of more down to earth and she has to like grapple and struggle her way through and much mm-hmm. more aware of everything. And I, I really like that, that small little, little beat to show that. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't think of that. And now Matt, it's time for another episode. Scott doesn't like it. (laughs) Go Um, ahead, Scott. I don't like this idea of infinite chain. I realize it solves the problem, but it's one of those things that like, it's a small little moment that when you start expanding on it and thinking of it, it can potentially break the world. 
Um, I like that they take the time that Wild Bill takes the time to say that there's an energy cost to it and there's like battery that's presumably used up as she makes chain. But um, if you can replicate one thing, can you replicate other things? Because like this whole city is needs water and food and people are dying and starving. Um, can we do something with that? Like it just like it, it it's the potential for over like for how powerful this could be is dangerous to me. Yeah, as a scientist slash engineer, that does always kind of derail me when when there's stuff like that. It, it's not necessarily that, that that I'm like, oh, this is bullshit. It, it's more that I'm like, wait a minute, that that would imply if you if you can store enough energy in a battery to generate matter, then surely you can store enough. In, and like, I just like go on a huge tangent about it, and it's like, right. well, well, okay, whatever. I mean, it, uh, ultimately, um, I think it all it all pans out um but but I, I my brain always kind of snags on things like this which yeah 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 i think i at this point like i stopped reading and started speculating and yeah that's distracting <laughs> yeah so uh shadow stalker doubles back and leads her over to look down on a situation that she's found a group of 12 thugs are about to attack a middle-aged woman down on the street and Although Flechette wants to intervene immediately, Shadow Stalker waits until the men actually attack her before stepping in so that it's more clearly a crime. And as it, as it progresses, Flechette is basically kind of like stunned because of the way Shadow Stalker uses violence so casually, almost gleefully. She's just beating the crap out of these guys. Um, even though she could probably have picked them off at range with her tranquilizer darts, she's just relishing the opportunity to smash their faces in with her metal knee pads. So basically the way she does this is she's just shifting in and out of her shadow state to let their blows pass through her and then returning brutal attacks by shifting into a solid form. Hey, uh, remember when I said that maybe Shadowstalker was pretending to be nicer when she was in her cape form to fit along with the wards better? Mm-hmm. That was, I was wrong. Yeah. That was, that was wrong. I'm sorry. That's, that's just who she is. <laughs> it's just, it's just, the, just that person. Whoops. So, um... Yeah, so Flechette eventually steps in, and she pretty much limits herself to just pinning guys in place with with darts and, and arrows, basically just pinning them through their clothing into walls and stuff. Uh, the two heroines end up leaving the men dangling from special restraining devices to be picked up later by the PRT officers. Hey, hey Matt, you know, yes. you know, it made this fight a lot easier. What's that? Scott? Some of that sticky foam that gets people all trapped in sticky foam and they can't get out. Well, well, Scott, though, what if that? requires a giant heavy backpack to carry around though i mean you can phase in and out of reality <laughs> <laughs> look I'm what sorry. if the phone doesn't survive the phasing process okay <laughs> fair fair you, you fixed it <laughs> yeah there you go I, I watch star trek scott nothing can <laughs> pass me um so so the woman they were attacking now uh steps in and just starts attacking one of the one of the defeated restrained thugs and Flechette tries to stop her but shadow soccer just wants to let her do it and to not quote render her powerless again which is actually something of an understandable thought process like i think i actually at this moment i felt like i was being challenged is Flechette being the naive outsider who doesn't understand how it is in brockton bay or is Shadow Soccer just justifying her own bloodthirstiness or some of both? What do you think? Um, to me, Shadow Soccer is being evil. Um, <laughs> th this, this to me is just like a really clear demonstration that that panic, fear, and chaos has really just completely gripped the city and it's affecting everyone. Um, victims are now lashing out. Like this, the story makes a, a special point to say that like someone had assaulted this woman's daughter. It wasn't this guy, but it was a person mm -hmm. like him. So she's taking it out on him. Um, and, and they're they're turning to violence as a way to cope with their needs, which is exactly what Shadow Stalker was doing as well. Um, so of course, Shadow Stalker wants everyone to kind of lean into that, considering her whole thing is that um, things are never going to get better here and it's only going to get worse and maybe it should. Um, mm -hmm. I think Flechette, on the other hand, understands that violence just begets more violence and that that rule of law is necessary. And is that naive? Um, maybe, but I think it's right. Yeah, I think you're supposed to come down on, on her side, but it was interesting that I felt myself actually being like, well, maybe she should just let that woman get her licks in there. 
Yeah, um, I mean, there's a short amount of, there's a short term benefit, right? It makes the woman feel better. It makes her feel less powerless. Um, mm-hmm. But but I I really love Flechette's counter to this is like you can you you can help her. And she says, I am helping her by making her not do something that she'll regret later. I really right. like that, that little yeah. beat. Yeah. And, and then, of course, Shadow Stalker goes on to say that capes, and in this case, teenage wards, are cop, judge, jury, and executioner. So it kind of uh, uh, retroactively invalidates what she was saying, where she was pretending to be all uh, egalitarian. Yeah, because Judge Dredd was completely authorized in his senseless murder of people, right? Yes, exactly. So Judge Dury and Executioner all in one person is always a good idea. Yeah. Um, this does really ra- raise an interesting point, though, about the level of legal authority being granted to these children. Um, mm-hmm. Does 13-year-old Vista have the capacity to make those kind of moral decisions on the fly? Um do the wards need more oversight? Because it seems like they have someone like on comms, but they only call them when they need them. It doesn't seem like anyone's watching them. Um, so, Matt, who who watches the Watchmen? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I haven't finished reading that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole the whole ward situation is something we could definitely just like go on a complete tangent about. But but it's like yeah. It, it it almost doesn't make any sense in, until you consider that unless you give these people like this channel for their for their powers, they're going to find some other channel for their powers and probably right. end up in groups like the Undersiders. So right. So so while it does seem like unbelievable that they would be giving thirteen year old Dissa this type of power, um, the legal power that is, um, it's necessary in this in this setting. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, Flechette and, and Shadow Stalker have not come to any agreement here, and Flechette just leaves angry and frustrated with how things have gone, feeling like she gave Shadow Stalker every chance. Um, and basically, that just suits Shadow Stalker fine because she'd prefer to be alone. So, so Flechette calls in on the comms and informs Kid Wynn that she's going to go alone for the rest of the night. And he confirms that, yeah, it's easier to work around her. So basically the implication being that Shadow Soccer is always like this and not just when she's being Sophia, which confirms what you were saying. Yeah, my, my bad. Um, <laughs> and I think it, it would be cool to theorize if this is a result of the Leviathan fight, fight, and it might be on some level. But yeah, I like that the story is specifically telling us this is just who she is. Yeah, nobody wants to work with her and nobody ever has. And it's important because, and we'll touch on this later, but we see kind of every character in this uh uh, arc reach some level of catharsis by the end of it um except for her mm-hmm. yeah that's a good point so flechette um finagles from kid win some info about where parian is that's how i'm going to pronounce it sue me uh, we saw flechette meet parian at the cape gathering prior to the leviathan fight um and so flechette wants to see her again so she, as she makes her way to Perrin's territory, we get to see how completely destroyed the city is from ground level. Yeah, before we get on that, let's uh, take a moment to focus on how Kidwin just has excessive amounts of detail on what a Perrin doll is on the top of his head. <laughs> dork. He's a dork. But I love it, though. I love that touch. <laughs> yeah, it, it, is really, it is a really good character beat, and I love how Flechette is immediately like, that's weird. <laughs> um... But yeah, like we are being constantly reminded about the destruction. And this was about the point when I realized when we see this big lake and we're told again that the streets are still kind of flooded with standing water. um, Where did all the heroes go? Because like we saw everyone come together to fight Leviathan. And then it seems like everyone just left. And like we know that some of these people have the ability to help out. Like we saw, I forget his name, but we saw the one guy that turned a water into mist that basically evaporated water. That would be really helpful right now. Um, and like you could help rebuild, like you could help, um, clear the streets, like the super strength, clear rubble. Like there's all these things that superheroes could be doing to help rebuild the city. And it seems like it's not happening and it's just being left to rot. And that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we could speculate about why that is Um, like off the cuff. It would seem that 
there's an implication that like they really needed back in their home cities to to do their heroing work. Um, I, we really don't know if if every place is is as bad or even close to as bad as Brockton Bay is. Yeah. But, but you can imagine if you know, arms master and miss militia and and you know, half the wards had to go off to some other city for a couple of weeks to do some some reconstruction. Um, the villains would definitely capitalize on that opportunity. So, and I do think that's fair. But I think we see in our world when there's like some sort of natural disaster somewhere a lot of the countries like team together and help with the reconstruction and, and stuff like that. And it's just very surprising that in a world of superheroes that can literally pick up rubble and rebuild buildings with their minds, um, we don't, we don't see that. Yeah. Yeah. I think there may be some other, some other reasons. I, I, I'll, I'll try to remember to, to mention it again toward, toward, uh, toward uh, the end when we get to a different character. Sure. But uh, yeah, I don't think it'll be a big deal if I forget, but all right, so um, so Flechette trips a trap line entering Perrin's territory, and a giant gorilla doll that's like 12 feet tall or something slams down to the ground in front of her, smashing things with its fists. Uh, so Flechette perceives that this is one of Perrin's sewn creations, which is one of, basically, it's a, it's a puppet. I love this power. It's so weird and unique. I, I love it. It's so funny. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't really quite understand how it works other than she sews them and then she uses telekinesis to move them around, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. So Perrin arrives and confronts her and refuses to let her approach, but she is willing to talk to her. Lachette asks how she's doing and Perrin says that she's coping. Um, I thought that was an interesting beat because Lachette doesn't quite connect like on the right wavelength there. She's like, Oh, oh that's good. Uh, and then she kind of wants to like, yeah. move things along. Um, to, like she doesn't realize how, uh, how like messed up pairing is at this point. So she off, she gives her her card and she tells her to contact her if she needs anything. And Perry says that we, they need fresh water. So that's something that Flechette can help with. And sure then wish there was a guy that could create a giant <laughs> block of ice and melt it down to give people water. Yeah. Whatever. I'm, I'm I'm getting over it, but okay. Well, well, Scott, it's. <laughs> I think I think you should view it as a as a mystery rather than a plot okay. hole. Okay, that's is my suggestion. I'm not. Uh, yeah, I I I hate the term plot hole. I will never view stuff like that as a plot hole. So that's just you can't you can't pick out a plot hole as you're reading. Um, yeah. It's just something I noticed and commented on. Sure. So Flechette sees that Perrion is is shaking and she at this point kind of realizes that the things are a little bit off. So she pushes a little bit harder and asks, um, um, if Perrin is, is okay. And Perrin admits that she hates fighting. Yeah, this is really tragic. And we're going to see in clock blockers chapter next that something I never really thought about the idea that most of the superpowers gained trend toward are specifically related to violence and fighting. Um, and, why that is. And I, I, when they heard that in the next chapter, I was like, huh. And that kind of um, ties in here. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, Flechette basically, she's just trying to disarm and, and make, make Perrion feel better. So she takes off her mask and reveals her real name. Actually, no, she's doing more than trying to make Perrion feel better, honestly. But she's also doing that. And then Perrion returns by taking off her mask. Um, and yeah, so it's clear at this point, and it, and it has been clear for some time now that, uh, that Flechette is gay and that she, she was kind of attracted to Shadow Stalker, but then thought that Shadow Stalker was horrible and, and kind of gave up on her and, and that she is attracted to Perrion. So she's basically trying to, to flirt with her and find out more about her. Um, it's called description fucking Matt. We have a term for this. Oh, Use yeah. the right term. You're right. I'm sorry. She's she's been description fucking uh, Perrion frequently mm -hmm. throughout this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. As much as I joke, um, I think it's really cool to have a, a gay character within the series. Um, you know, Worm is really diverse, um, but never like artificially like in Power Rangers. We needed a character of every type of race and sexual orientation to be called diverse. Um, it just seems to naturally fit. Um, Flechette isn't gay because we need a gay character now. It's just kind of who she is. Um, and 
we haven't talked about it. This isn't the first time we've seen Worm kind of tackle social issues. Um, and you and I don't always dive into it in detail because I think we're both straight white dudes um, and don't have too much to contribute to a diversity conversation. But I don't think that means we don't appreciate it on some level. Yeah. And, I, and I really like Flechette as a character. I think she's really interesting. And I, I'm really hoping we get to see more of her. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I think her sexual orientation feels completely organic here. And it, I, I think it it's it's only when I like try to be analytical that I'm like, even then I even consider that it's a choice that an author made at some point, you know, it just feels like, Oh, of course this character is gay. Yeah. 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 And it's okay that it's a choice. I think the important thing is it's not a gimmick and it's not yeah. a character defining attribute. It's one we're hinted at throughout the entire entirety of her chapter, but it only really is fully revealed by the end of it. It is not what defines her as a character. Yeah, totally. All right. So we leave, we leave, we leave Flechette there flirting with Parian. And we move on to our best friend, Clock Blocker. Yes. So he's sitting in a in a classroom at the HQ with the other wards and some PRT uniforms. And Glory Girl is also there for some reason. We don't know why yet. They're watching a video recording of a lecture from sometime in the past, the class Para 103. So it's, it's kind of a mid-range advanced college course about parahumans. And it's seemingly a class that discusses all the big setting questions that we have as readers. Where do powers come from? Why? Why do powers seem slanted toward combat? How does the nature of the trigger event shape the power? Why do powers seem to move in families? So the people in the setting are asking the same questions that we we're asking as the readers. Yeah, can I take this class, please? I would really like to be part of this class. Yes, you may. But unfortunately, Clockblocker doesn't really seem interested in the class, so <laughs> the exposition that we do get to see is, is in the background. Um, and I think that's really kind of a cool way to... Uh, show his the the tonal shift to his point of view and show um how he sees things that this stuff that i think for taylor like taylor i feel would be eating this stuff up a clock blocker it's just kind of in the background yeah and, and he's got he's kind of mentally preoccupied with a lot of different things actually as we'll see yeah yeah um yeah, just just incidentally on on this topic nothing is more deflating in world building than seeing that the big setting questions have never occurred to anyone in the setting. Like the, I feel like I, I am a wheel of time fan, but I feel like that happens all the time where it's like for thousands of years, no one has thought to ask the basic questions that you as the reader are asking immediately after the first chapter. Oh, like lost, um, like the entirety yeah. of lost. Yes. That's, that's another, I mean, there, there, there's lots of examples, honestly. Yeah, there are. Um, but in yeah. Worm, it's like, yep, yeah, look, 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 there's smart people in this world. Obviously, they're asking these questions, and they're hard questions. Otherwise, I would have figured out the answers already. So, yeah. So, discussion on the video arises about the fact that people tend to trigger with multiple powers when other people in the area trigger contemporaneously. And at this point, Kid Wynn calls out to Flechette and asks if anybody in her area triggered when she did because she has a handful of powers. Matt, there's so many little tidbits of information here. Um, we learn that when trigger, when people trigger around other people, they get multiple powers, um, as if they're getting like a blowback of that person's trigger. Um, I think this also kind of serves to explain how Fenja and Menja maybe came to mind, because we also learned that if you're really the closer you're related to someone, and the closer your triggering event to someone is, you get similar powers. Um, but then we also learn that there's more girl capes than boy capes. And I'm like, why is that? And then we get confirmation in world confirmation that they do realize that the triggering event, the trigger event scenario leads to the type of powers, not just on a metaphorical level, but also on a literal scientific level. Um, there's so much going on here and I, I love it. And then, yeah. and then what happens, Matt? And then Weld interrupts and chastises Kid Win for interrupting the lecture which obviously annoys clock blocker. Yeah. And it all annoys me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, this, this, this I think is a, a testament to the point of view, right? Like I just finished uh -huh. telling you how much I loved weld and now suddenly we're in clock blocker's head and he comes off as like this annoying hall monitor. And yeah. it's just like, so annoying. Like he annoyed me and it's like, and, and you realize that and you're like, wow, like we're so far into this guy's point of view that suddenly my opinion of a character is changing just from that point of view. Yeah, right. And and you can totally imagine it, if you work at it, you can imagine the scene from Wells' point of view, and he's like, "Huh? Well, I, I uh, let me take this opportunity to try to like like right, his right, his, yeah. his well-meaningness, you know, 
Um, yeah. but, but that's also, not how it sounds. Yeah, but also Kidwin's stupid question made me miss what the professor was saying about Eidolon, and I hate you, Kidwin. I mm-hmm. hate you so much. Yeah, just thanks, God. If he hadn't interrupted, we could have learned valuable setting information. I know. Okay, I'll, I, will, I swear I will never like this guy. Nothing okay. can make me like him. All right. I, I believe you. Yeah, so the the students and professors on the recording are also discussing the idea of capes that break the typical pattern, and they name Scion and the Inbringers, and somebody suggests somebody called Nilbog, but I think the professor says no to that one. And that's Goblin backwards. I don't know if that matters, but I knew that, so I bet he's awesome. Probably does matter. <laughs> um yeah, so then at this point, Dennis, who, which is Clocklocker's name, gets a text from his mom saying that his dad isn't doing well. And due to various horrific complications, he'll probably be dead in a few days, actually. Uh, so he pretty much immediately pulls Glory Girl out of class to talk to her. Um, and he, he's, he's working his way around asking for something, but first they kind of just chat. And she tells him that New Wave is disbanding after losing so many of its members. So she's going to see about joining the wards, possibly. And he, then he works his way around to asking if she'll ask Panacea if she can heal his dad. So remember that Panacea absolutely could do it, but she has very specific rules about who she helps. And Glory Girl agrees to ask her, which is surprising to Dennis. Yeah, I think this is this is such a rough situation, and it reminds us once again that in this world, there just are no easy answers. Um, like i love panacea i love her so much and her stance on this whole thing makes perfect sense right because if she honors one request like this how long before she gets millions and it's just completely overwhelming and she can't take it anymore and it's just this like it's this tragic character who wants to be able who has the power like one person having the power to heal everyone but just physically can't and how and we just keep getting reminded how awful that must feel I just, I love this character. I guess that's probably who sh- I want to see in her head. I'm changing my answer. I want to see in Panacea's head. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, there, there's definitely secrets there that, that we're being kept from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Vista comes outside of the classroom to check on them. Uh, and then Well follows her out into the hall. And, you know, he's basically trying to bring order to the class, which makes Clock Clocker even more annoyed. Yeah, and me too again um because yeah. when he says we paused the video for you like i know in weld's mind that's an, an appreciative like hey like we paused the video for you because we didn't want you to miss it but it comes off as we paused the video for you and like right. it's so annoying and i just love i like wild Bo, man nailed it like the way we're so into this guy's head it's it's perfect yeah, no, that, that's that's great how the phrase we pause the video for you could be used to mean like three different things if it were read three yeah, different ways. Yeah, yeah, That's That's fantastic. So, yeah, so Weld goes back inside and Clockblocker calls him a tool behind his back, which is what you just called him, Scott. <laughs> um, and then Vista actually defends Weld to Clockblocker, pointing out that Weld is is working really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like this yeah. a lot. Yeah, I'm gonna call them metal fours now. That's what I'm gonna call. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so Clockblocker actually just snaps at her for doing this, asking if she's quote channeling Gallant, which he says this in front of Gallant's girlfriend and and the girl who was infatuated with him. So it's obviously a terrible faux pas, and he feels horrible immediately. Um, I. I I, I guess he just kind of, it was just kind of a slip. He like forgot that Gallant was dead or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it was a slip. I think it ties into this anger that he's feeling. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. there's this, this level of like, he is pissed off and he's mad at everything. And that's kind of one of the, the hints of that, um, that we kind of learn later is, is not the usual case for clock blocker. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. Yeah. So yeah, so Vista runs away in tears using her power to escape quickly and Glory Girl is also furious with him but she tells him that she's giving him a pass and then demands that he apologize to Vista. So he follows her uh, and finds her in a stairwell and I think he apologizes pretty well actually. I don't think I've ever apologized to anyone as well as as well as Dennis apologizes here. 
And then they bond over how much they both miss Gallant and how much Gallant genuinely did like her, which she she's kind of insecure about that because she felt like she just had like a crush on him and that he probably didn't feel anything like that in return. So it's important to her to hear that from from him. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really appreciated that note we got a couple weeks ago about always remember how young these people are. I really appreciated that in this scene alone um, because. I mean, even Clockblocker is still a young guy, and Vist is even younger, and they just watched people they worked with and loved die, and they're just not emotionally equipped to handle this at all. Um, mm-hmm. They're kind of just forced to move on and forced to deal with it to get the job done, and they ha- they feel like they have to because they have the power to do something. And I just love I love that I love this sense of obligation um, that we see in these heroes that we we really haven't gotten to spend a lot of time in the heroes' heads uh, from the heroes' point of view, and we're seeing the burden of of this obligation and I love it. Yeah. And, and it, it is at this point that Vista points out how angry clock has been and that this isn't really the dentist that she knows. So we're, we're being shown that, yeah, he's really angry at everything and he's lashing out right now, but this isn't, this isn't who he was before the tragedy. Yeah. yeah. This is really nice moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so luckily uh, we, instead of having to go back to the boring classroom, the team of, teenagers is sent to a horrifying crime scene out of saw yay (laughs) saw so uh yeah so they head to this uh this place it's a destroyed ruin of a building with only three exterior walls standing and strung up on the walls are three mutilated bodies one flayed one charred black and one with its arms and legs amputated and then reattached with lengths of chain. Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is insane. Yeah. The, and yep. Yeah. So hanging out in this building for some reason are the travelers. Um, Trickster, pretty believably and, and humorously, in my opinion, claims that they didn't do this and they should just be allowed to leave now. Uh, but well, won't let them go without being questioned. Um. And That's Trickster, j- just to add some flavor, Trickster also mentions that the guy who had all of his limbs cut off was still still alive when they arrived. Yeah, so then they get into a meaningless fight that does nothing, and um, they're not really on the opposite side of things. They just feel like they have to fight because things. Yeah, so so I just wanted to to say here, like, I I, I read this whole arc way too fast the first time I read Worm because. I wanted to get to the answer of whether Taylor was going to rejoin the undersiders or not. So I was kind of, I don't want to say skimming, but not really giving things their due the first time through. So this was like a little gem for me to find this, this battle where it's like, you're right that it's sort of a meaningless fight. Um, But that's actually an interesting thing about it because of how the characters behave and and what we learn about them. Yeah, yeah. Um, So so like, even though it's a globally meaningless fight, it's it's not meaningless to the characters, and I think that's an interesting spin here. So the so the fight starts. um, And uh, first of all, this is really the first time we get to see Trickster's power in action, and he's swapping people seemingly instantly as long as they're in line of sight. So he's doing things like making Kid Wind shoot himself. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's uh, he's putting tougher opponents like Weld and close range capes like Clock Blocker out of reach. He's dealing with projectiles effortlessly. Generally, he's just controlling the whole battlefield, and it's uh, it's a deceptively strong power, actually. Yeah, and it's annoying. I love I love the annoyance to it, and I love how we can feel. Uh, Clockbocker's annoyance to it because we see that anger kind of rise in him that like behind his like it, we get the idea that Clockbocker is this kind of sarcastic jokester or was um his name is Clockbocker <laughs> but right. yeah we see this anger and and it's been referenced to us we've seen it a couple times and we really see it here um and also I will never stop loving King Kidwin shooting himself <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, and, and I mean th- this really highlights why his name is Trickster because yeah, it, he's he's just continually tripping you up and making you do stupid things and making you look like a fool basically. Uh, so G- Genesis is also here in the form of a giant, strong, durable gargoyle, and uh, this projection also breathes out a noxious, gaseous irritant. So we we learn through Clock Locker that her, her the projections aren't just tough distractions; they they also have their own 
individual powers. Yeah, this seems really powerful. Um, does she have like a limit to how many of these projections she can create? Is there like a set amount or can she make anything she wants that has its own power? I mean, that seems ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, we we don't know. We don't know. And I, I mean, we've only ever seen her have one at a time, certainly. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So at this point, we're we're wrapping up Clock Locker and Dennis feels oddly calm. And despite what we just mentioned, that this combat is essentially meaningless, he feels like it's his place to be here. Yeah, I love I love that moment. Um, and, and it's like this this really feeling that all these doubts he had, all this anger he had kind of melts away just when he has the ability to do all this violence. And it is it is essential that it's on a fight that's ultimately meaningless. They're mm-hmm. not like preventing Trickster and his crew from doing anything. Um, they're not fighting a giant monster. There's just guys happen to be at a crime scene. And we're going to fight now. Um, and that's you, you kind of worry for Clock, Clockwalker in that, that moment. Um, but I do appreciate and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how we see characters arcs. Um, continue through the arc um, through different points of view. And we see this moment where Weld like helps Clockblocker stand up after he uh, fell down. And there's this moment of connection between the two of them. Um, and like from that point on, we see less uh, resistance and less fighting between the two of them. And it's just a small moment that's not really even harped on, but like how these characters have found a way to come to an agreement together. Um, I love small little moments like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's the, all of the rest of the Clockblocker Weld relationship is shown from the outside, and yet we do see it evolving. Yeah. So yeah, so mid fight we switch perspectives over to Kid Win, uh, chapter four four point nine. Uh, your favorite character, Scott? Yay. <laughs> um, seriously though, you're about to see me like one eighty on Kid Win <laughs> over the next ten minutes or so. Okay. Well, all may- right. Well, maybe not 180, maybe like a 110, or like a <laughs> 105. Um, I'm going to finish the chapter liking King Kidwin a little more, is what I'm saying. Um, right. And I think that that's, comes from these first two sentences, um, and I think this is perfect. Uh, he says right at the beginning, I'm a tinker, I'm supposed to be smart, so how can I have been so stupid? And then suddenly, everything you thought you knew about this character and his posturing is gone. And then we just like we it's almost a clean slate and we just learn everything new about him from this point on. Yeah, absolutely. And and we'll get into that, certainly. But um, it's, basically, it, it opens up more focusing on the combat a- after that moment. So, you know, yeah, the um, the the travelers are, are being pretty rough on them. Uh, the ballistic is actually calling his shots before he takes them so that people can take cover. And it's pretty obvious that Ballistic could probably just kill almost all the wards in short order if he used his power all out. Likewise, Sundancer is using her orb mainly to deny the wards access to certain areas or to block them rather than to use it offensively to incinerate them, which we know she can do. Yeah, and this I think that ties back to this feeling of this is a, a meaningless, useless battle and it's kind of just a proxy fight that we're fighting just because we both happened to be here at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so from his inner thoughts, and this is where we get into his self-talk, uh, we find out that Kidwin dismantled his own hoverboard for parts for a project that he never finished, which is why he's stumbling around like a chump with an inferior spark pistol. <laughs> he's such a dummy. Yeah. But, but and then so this is the difference now, is we realize he's aware of his own dumminess, um, and that's so key here. Yeah, and he actually feels worse about it. Like he gives yeah. him a harder, he gives himself a harder time than we can even give him, and, and that totally shifts how you feel about him. Right. Uh, at this point, Ballistic shoots Glory Girl as a projectile, um, or at least maybe he's touching her shirt and he shoots her shirt, but he basically just ejects her from the battlefield at some incredible velocity, and she sort of she doesn't make it back for like the whole fight it's it's hilarious <laughs> i love this so much and it feels almost like a cartoon right and yeah. it's it's kind of a refreshing fight after like the brutal terrifying battles we've seen over the last few arcs um and it's like refreshing that we're having this kind of comical arc and as i say that i'm reminded that there are three terribly mutilated corpses 50 feet away from where they're fighting and i am depressed again so yep. that's worm <laughs> yep welcome to earth bat uh, Kidwin loses his pistol to Trickster, um, 
but he does manage to shoot and destroy Genesis with his rifle. Which he uh, is <laughs> shocked about. Yeah, he like, feels bad about, even though he just contributed to the fight. Yeah. And then it starts to rain, and once again, Trickster asks if they could just go peacefully because the evidence is going to be destroyed, but Weld continues to refuse. So at this point, Trickster turns the situation where the wards are surrounding the travelers into the travelers surrounding the wards, and then proceeds to replace the burned corpse with Weld and the flayed corpse with Vista. And Vista ends up, you know, in a kind of a dangerous situation, all tangled up in the wires. Yeah, the Trickster is like so annoying, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of love it. I, I like yeah. him so much. I Me think too. we said I think we said a few arcs ago that I can't wait to see this guy's power in action and how annoying it was. And I was uh, not let down. Yeah, totally. So uh, Sundancer uses her orb to create a ton of steam to cover the Traveler's retreat. And, uh, and then it takes two more minutes from that point for Glory Girl to make her way back. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love that we have this beat. Yeah. You guys, what I miss? Did I miss the fight? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the wards circle the wagons, and Kid Wynn thinks about how he's been diagnosed with ADD and dyscalculia. Uh, so er- everything about being a tinker is a struggle for him. He has trouble with motivation, finishing tasks, and even things that should be simple, like taking measurements. He built the alternator cannon while on some ADD medication, but he had to stop due to side effects, and now that's been destroyed. So this loss of the Travelers seems like a real blow to his confidence. Yeah, and suddenly I realized I was being a huge dick and making fun of a guy with learning disabilities forever. <laughs> um, and I feel bad. I, I, and, and I think this reveal showed us, shows us, you know, two important things. I think, firstly, um, all of the ridiculousness that we've seen in Kid Wynn, his, his even his name, um, is, is just posturing to hide mm-hmm. his insecurities. Um, and that's so key. And I think that leads into my second point, which is you can never, you can never truly understand a person until you, you are fully in their head. And in this story, that's possible. And so now we get to understand who this person is. And suddenly it's like, it's like, I, I, I get you, Kidwin. I get you. Yeah. Yeah. Change your name though. It's a stupid name. <laughs> Still not going to let that go. Never. So, so, so back at the HQ, um, they learned that there were two other crime scenes, each of which having three bodies for a total of nine murders. And Kid Wynn is the one who comes up with the theory that it's the Slaughterhouse Nine, which we know nothing about them really, other than that they're the kind of people who would commit nine gruesome murders with saw like stylings. Um, yeah, do they even say if they're capes or not? Um, I would assume in this world, but. I don't think they necessarily specifically say that no, they do. I don't think yeah. they do. Yeah. And and even in discover even in making this connection, he manages to give himself no credit. He's like, Oh well, I'm not sure someone else would have noticed it. It's Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing because we see this with him again and again, right? Um yeah. because besides shooting himself in the head with his own gun, um, he was actually pretty useful in that previous fight, right? He was mm-hmm. the one that knocked out Genesis. He rescued Vista from hanging, like he shot the wire out. Um, he made smart decisions. He looked at the battlefield and said, these people have got it. I need to help out over here. Um, the, the, the central issue of his appears to be his doubt and his lack of confidence. Um, and so if, if this kid wasn't so worried about losing, he might be able to win. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, and then he could earn that name. Yeah. He could earn that awesome name that he has. Yeah. Um. No. 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 Yeah. So the ward's duties for the night are divided up, and Kid Win is assigned to go recruit the new tinker slash mover who we keep talking about, uh, Chariot. Kid Win is insecure at the very idea of another tinker on the team who could potentially replace him. Uh, Weld mentions that the team needs to have these meetings every day now to keep on the same page, and Clockblocker, now obviously trying to give Weld some leeway, goes along with it and doesn't object. Yeah, and that's this uh, closure via different points of view that we were talking about. Um, Vista asked Clockblocker to give Weld a chance, and we see it happening. I like this guy a lot. I like him. Yeah. So later, Kid Wynn shows up at the rundown area where Chariot lives. I guess the whole city is rundown, but, you know... It's an example. Yeah. He makes his way up through the alarming apartment building to Chariot's home. Um, so actually, Kid Wynn seems pretty good at this and maybe even has a little bit of confidence for the first time. He manages to play to what the kid needs and what he's missing. And he 
also tactfully edges the mom out of the conversation. And during this, we get a little bit more world building flavor information about tinkers specifically that tinkers need workshops and materials that they, they almost have to ally themselves with other capes because they don't have, they don't have powers the same way other capes do. Uh, and also that protectorate capes make extra money by producing parts. And we even learn about what kind of salaries the wards make. Yeah, you're right. He's really good at this. I mean, he's really able to read the room very well and play to everyone's strengths. And he does actually make a lot of good points. I joined the wards if I was a tinker. Um, uh, so Kid Win, just don't believe in yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's funny to me because like he's he's reading things into like slight pauses and hesitations in conversation. So he's he's actually very socially intelligent and, and ironically right. not like a stem you know, student, <laughs> even though he's a tinker. So yeah, I, that's yeah. a very interesting combination. Um, yeah, I, I like this line in particular where, where his mom is like, could you, could you just maybe not use your powers? And Kid Wynn is basically like, sure. What do you think, Chariot? You think you could keep from using that power of yours? Be normal? And it's clear, it's just clear that he's like, this is absurd. Um, which maybe speaks to something you said earlier about like, are, are there people who are not using their powers? It's, it's it seems from from chariot's reaction that it's like no of course not like it, it's like an itchy as a scratch yeah and it makes me wonder if there's like something inherent to the powers themselves that like make it, it there's so much a part of you that it would be like not eating or breathing mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that, that's a really interesting train of thought that really hadn't been discussed at this point yeah um, no it, it's yeah and kid win is the one who's making it yep so uh, yeah, he he's noticing that Chariot's replies are are off. They don't feel organic. He's faking reluctance to join the wards. Um, so as he leaves, he hacks into Chariot's wireless network and monitors his web traffic. And he sees that Chariot is reporting in to some other party that he now is in with the wards. Yeah, and again we see his competence and his ability to to do stuff, and it's really great. Um, this is definitely Coil, right? I mean, it's it's like <laughs> that's exactly where my brain went, and I think it's confirmed in the next chapter, but yeah, or at least yeah. kind kind of confirmed. It's yeah, it's, it's confirmed that everyone thinks that that's true anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so let's just move quickly in the next chapter. We we yeah. switch to Vista. So uh, Vista and Flechette are now meeting with Perrin at her territory, and they're you know Flechette's bringing in the supplies that Perrin asked for, and Perrin kind of like absentmindedly basically knits a stuffed rabbit for Vista. And I think, you know, I didn't write this down, but as we've been talking through it, I've seen every chapter like starts with this moment of story efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the one for this chapter. Um, and this is, this is so much show don't tell, right? This is um, this idea. We, we quickly understand who Parian is and who Vista is in this little quick moment. Um, like she, like, Perrion is a bit out of sync. She doesn't fully understand the age of Vista, um, but she's trying. She's trying to be nice to her. And Vista, for her part, is insulted, but she's understanding. She thanks her for the doll. She doesn't say anything. She's kind. And, like, all this is shown just through the handing of a stuffed rabbit from one character to another. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it shows, first of all, we haven't seen yet that Vista has all of this, like, resentment and, and anger and... Mm -hmm. And and semi depression going on in her, um, but um, but we see how she's covering it up also at the same time right. that we're seeing it. So Weld calls them back to the HQ based on the information that uh, that uh, Kid Wind just called in, and Vista uses her power to dramatically shorten the trip back. It's, it's a really fun moment. I like it. Yeah, walking, who walks all the way? Yeah, just, just use her shaker nine, whatever. Yeah, yeah. no big deal. So Vista perceives all of Flechette's attempts on the walk back at conversation as condescending, and she chooses to turn the conversation into fatalistic and dark directions. She's annoyed that Vista considers her maturity or dismal fatalism, depending on how you read it, as remarkable, and just generally she has an obvious chip on her shoulder about being young. Yeah, which is really understandable, right? I mean, we've been in her mind for like a page and she's been given a doll and been called mature for her age. Um, so, like, we've been with her for just a short amount of time. We've already seen over and over again how she's reminded of how much younger she is than everyone. And I, and I, I do think her fatalism is a little understandable, too. 
that she's this 13 year old kid and she's been through this ordeal that would shake a full grown adult. And she's kind of dealing with it in the only way she knows how. Um, and she doesn't seem to have a lot of help in that. Right. Like she needs to be, you know, in therapy, not serving yeah. as a law enforcement officer. Right. right. Um, yeah. So she's, she's clearly, as they move into the PRT building, she's strong, she's strongly affected by the black and white portraits of the dead heroes in the lobby. I think we're seeing that theme of appearances and reputation a bit, even here actually, because she hates her picture because it's goofy and, and she thinks she looks guileless and she wants to be remembered as like a tough, real hero. Yeah. And this, this kind of, I think to Kai ties into her depression a little bit that her thought is when my picture is going to be up there, um, right. I, I'm going to be remembered wrongly and that's depressing and sad and, and like, but at the same time, I mean, it's like, it, it, I love that throughout all this depression and sadness, like the idea of quitting for her just is just never approached. Like mm -hmm. that's just not an option for her. It's just, I'm going to continue on. I'm just going to be sad about it for the rest of my, what could be short life. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that is really depressing. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. So they meet with the team and Pigot tells them that, uh, they already knew that Coyle had heavily infiltrated the PRT with multiple agents. Um, and that she suspects Chariot to be another such plant. And she actually wants to go ahead and let him in so he can be monitored and fed this information. And the team agrees to let this happen. Yeah, this is a really fun uh, case of uh, dramatic irony, because considering what we know of Coil's power, this is a pretty risky plan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I didn't think about that until you drew, drew my attention to it. But yeah, like if, if you were an infiltrator working for Coil then you can just brazenly steal things and not worry about getting caught and then tell Coil what you stole. And then Coil can just cancel that world line. And so you're still in place as an agent day after day after day. Right. And Coil is just gaining information as if you brazenly stole it day after day after day. And that's so plausible that I'm almost 100% sure that that's exactly what's happening. Because yeah. we do see him have this supernatural amount of information um and yeah i mean it, it has to be yeah totally uh, i really do love again you know closing previous arcs uh in, in someone else's point of view we see uh pigo tell kid win good work on on this and like he kind of smiles and you feel this really this real sense of happiness for him um and again that's like a testament to what a point of view chapter can do because if i had seen that this time last week i would have rolled my eyes and snickered at him and now yeah. I'm like, I'm happy for you, kid. Like, here's some confidence. Like, good luck. Yeah, it's possible we would have even read it as like a smug smile, which it yeah. wasn't. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It's like a someone, someone likes me. Um, so, yeah. So Vista goes to take a shower and examines her current injuries from the fight and her various scars, including a large scar on her chest that she got from an encounter with Hook Wolf. And she recalls hiding the wound from the others so as not to seem weak at the time. Yeah, I do appreciate kind of the irony of the fact that the one thing that could make her look more adult is the one thing she hides because she's afraid it shows weakness. And it's just like how conflicted and confused Vista is just in general. Um, and like it, it ties into her depression and her character so much. I really like this, this shower yeah, I think, scene. I think it's very like realistic types of cognition for a 13 year old to be having, yeah. especially one who's who's under a lot of stress. So, yeah, so Sophia moves to the bathroom uh, and takes the opportunity to be an asshole to her for no reason and then moves on. Um, of course, I, I noticed in this scene that if we didn't know that it was Sophia, uh, then it probably wouldn't have seemed so mean. But because it is Sophia, we know that she means it in the worst possible way. God, yeah, she sucks. Like, she sucks so much. I hate her. Yeah, yeah. So then Vista heads to meet with Weld in his private room. Uh, we get a little bit of flavor on on, on Weld. So uh, Well admits that Flechette has expressed concerns about how Vista's holding up. And at first, Vista is defensive, but Weld proposes that maybe the wards are currently redefining themselves to take up the roles of their absent friends, and that Vista needs to maybe replace Gallant as the heart of the team. I, I read this part like five times over and over again as I was prepping, um, because I loved it so much. Um, like I mentioned you know, earlier, Weld is this character who kind of changes wildly as we jump from perspective to perspective. Um, we started off 
with him. We kind of grew to respect him. Then we jumped to clock blocker and we kind of got annoyed with him. And then here we are. Um, and here's where we leave him for now. But we, we kind of, we love him. Like I love him in this moment. And he just has this real, real ability to read Vista and, and just to know what she needs, um, and how, how to get through it. And it's really hard to sit here and, and read this moment and wonder if Taylor had a, a presence like Weld in her life, how different she could have turned out. Um, and I just, I God, I love this moment so much. Yeah, that's a great point. So yeah, so then Vista cries, and then we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I, I like this from from Weld because he, he he says, "You think I've never cried, looking like I do, facing the disappointments and frustrations I have? Maybe it's." self-serving to think so but i think it takes a kind of strength to let yourself face your emotions like that and i think that's great um because he he's so like stoic even in his own thoughts but like it's yeah if if you're this monstrous k53 you're gonna have some dark moments and and he's opening up about that to her yeah i love it i love it so much yeah, so on our way out, Vista goes by the console, and Sophia attacks her for crying. When Vista talks back to her, Sophia says that Vista annoyed Gallant, and he didn't like her. Basically, she's just trying to, she's just trying to be horrible. There's no, there's no she's reason. The worst. And then this prompts Vista to admit out loud that she loved Gallant, um, and Sophia then takes this as an opportunity to just attack her vulnerabilities even more and make her feel worse. But now Vista has like this frame shift where she's now trying to be the heart. So she's able to be kind of objective and kind of like open to like what's going on with Shadow Stalker. So she, she tries to turn this conversation on to Sophia and Sophia kind of freaks out and becomes like really angrily defensive and, and aggressive. Um, and when Vista says that she pities Sophia, Sophia literally tackles her and then storms out. Man, I mean, talk about character economy, right? I mean, we were just dropped into this arc with this cursory knowledge of each of these characters. And now we're seeing like interplay and drama and how they all relate to each other and how it all links together. We see Vista like standing up for herself and for others. We're seeing her embrace that advice that she was given to. We're seeing Shadowstalker's insecurities come out and how that all plays together. Like all these character interactions are so complicated. There's six people on this team right now and they all have different personalities and they're all playing off each other in different ways. And it's clear, all of it. And it's just like how this was done so quickly is amazing. Yeah, I agree. And 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 now we're moving into nine point six Shadow Stalker, and we're rounding out the entire the entire wards. We've now we will have seen into everyone's head, and uh, and and I think it will be a uh, a masterwork. Yep. So so yeah, just just a note here as we're moving in. Um, just generally, it seems like all the wards think of themselves as their hero names when they're in costume. Uh, do we make anything of this, or is this just like a third-person writing convention? I think it's probably a little of that, and a little of just the fact that um, being a ward to them is much more of a a job and an identity than it is for some of our other characters. Um, so, like this is his job. He's clock blocker. That's who Dennis is. So that's how he refers to himself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's fair. Yeah. So Sophia, um, she's tooling around town, blowing off steam from her frustrating encounter with that punk Vista. Uh, she calls her BFF, Emma and vents to her about the frustration of dealing with these terrible people who are the wards. And basically Sophia comes across really strongly here as somebody who always has to feel superior and that it's probably a reflexive protective mechanism of some kind. Uh, the way she re reacted to Vista's pity being the biggest sign of that. Absolutely. And there's something really strange in her conversation with Emma here. Um, we've kind of always seen Sophia and Emma's friendship from Taylor's point of view. And like from that point of view, Emma has always been like the de facto leader and Taylor just assumed that she was the one ordering her underlings around um, but even with, within this brief conversation, we, we see that that's not really true because Emma's comments to her during this conversation are really hesitative, hesitative and just reassuring. And she's just really like agreeing with everything she says, not challenging her on, on everything. Um, and that, f that ties into this need to feel superior. And I love that that's reflected not only in the content of the conversation she's in, but like how the conversation happens. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic, and it's not actually what you would have expected going into it. I agree. So yeah, so in in her own mind, Shadowstalker divides people into predators and prey. This is her this is her worldview. It's it's almost a distinctly amoral world worldview, um, because like it it may be even more amoral than Coyle's actually, because Coyle's moral sense was just like cold and empty. Whereas Sophia's is like angry and hostile toward everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really fabulously put. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think we're going to return to this at the very end of the arc, but Sophia feels like Taylor after she's gone past the point of no return to a point where she's just fundamentally like broken as a person and it just might be too late for her. Um, that's, that's the feeling I got from this. Um, I also just want to note that like she goes on this like internal monologue tangent in her head and Emma's just still on the phone with her (laughs) and she doesn't notice till the end of the conversation. And that like, it's a funny beat, but it's also like another way to reinforce what their relationship is that Emma would just sit on the phone, not saying anything, um, because she seems like totally subservient to this person. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely the aspect where Emma is, is kind of like flattered to be part of this this glamorous cape scene yeah yeah um so she's just she'll pretty much put up with whatever from from shadow saw her at least that's the feeling you get here yeah yeah so um so near shadow stalker a prt convoy passes and she kind of abruptly hangs up on emma and she follows the convoy and then suddenly the convoy is attacked by finner's chosen in uh, starting off with menya with her sister's shield um <laughs> And uh, Hook Wolf and Storm Tiger and Cricket, who have apparently recovered from their horrific injuries. Um, and then, like, a horde of mundane foot soldiers. And Miss Militia pops out of the truck and starts defending it. Yeah, you know, the, the sniff you did when Amanda with her sister shield, that, that's funny. And but it's also just this really great character beat. It's, it's almost yeah. like it's a dash in there. It's like, and, and Menja has her holds up her shield and it's like dash her sister's shield. And it's like, yeah. even, even in this moment with this villain who is a, like a white nationalist, terrible human being, we have this little character beat that shows that they're still human. Um, yeah. and she misses her sister and she's wearing her sister's shield to like honor her. And it's like, this is, it's so, it's just slipped in there and it's not focused on, but it's just so well done. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that moment also. So, uh, yeah, as, as Shadow Stalker is moving around and orienting to the battlefield, we get to see more detail on how our power works and how it feels from the inside, which I think is interesting. Um, so she, she gets a better vantage and she starts sniping the troops. Um, she's prepared to dive down and attack the foot soldiers hand to hand because she's craving the catharsis we see from her own point of view. She actually sees it that way. But then a spindly black clad figure with a yellow eyed mask um, attacks them first with a swarm of bugs and then disables them with her baton. That's our girl. She's back. Yeah. So as a general comment now, uh, we get so much delicious Taylor from outside Taylor's head description here. And it's, it's totally awesome. All the more because it's taken us so long to see this. She's transformed so gradually into a terrifying villain that inside her own head, it all just seems like a practical evolution of things. And of course she behaves this way. So it's kind of amazing to see from the outside, how far she's come Uh, here. She just wades into these grown men and confidently beats them down using her bugs (laughs) to, to like attack and defend at the same time while crushing kneecaps and whatever with her, her stick. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and I think the greatest part of all this is we're not in her head, but I could still like hear her thought process um as we saw her from someone else's point of view make decisions and do stuff we don't hear her internal monologue but we still see her like process and think through things and make decisions that like we know we know so much about taylor we know so much about her her thought process that we can see it even if we're not reading it yeah totally i I agree um, so yeah, Skitter steals some supplies from the truck and then heads off down an alley so i want to highlight shadow stalker this line Shadowstalker says, uh, hungry, are you? Shadowstalker murmured to herself. So is that her talking to herself or is that her rhetorically asking Skidder, who obviously can't hear her, if she's hungry for the supplies? 
I, I think it's wild both playing with language and I think it's supposed to be both. Okay. Um, there's this, this through line of the predator prey relationship throughout this chapter. And okay. I think it, it works both for both equally. And I think it's intentionally designed that way. Yeah. I, I like that. I like that interpretation. So it's clear from Sophia's narration that she's going to murder Skitter because Skitter saw her face and that's enough reason, right? So she, she switches her crossbow cartridges to lethal arrowheads um, and as she's about to attack, Skitter's bugs move through her, which which causes Skitter to become aware of her, and she bolts. Yeah, maybe this whole uh, ward reform program wasn't a good idea. <laughs> maybe taking a yeah. bad guy and putting and giving them authority to be a hero was a bad call. Yeah, I mean, what else are you gonna do though? So uh, so Shadowstalker closes with her, and they fight hand to hand. You, you actually Skitter actually comes off better than you expect, I think, because she's able to use her baton and her bugs in in clever ways to prevent Shadow Stalker from gaining as much advantage as she usually does with her power. Um, and Shadow Stalker thinks to herself, she can actually respect Skitter at least as a fellow predator. And at this point, I found myself asking, is Taylor now a fellow predator? Yeah, that's a, like I I thought about this question for a while and. My answer is kind of cheating and saying yes and no. I mean, I think Shadowstalker's point of view is so fucked up that, like, anyone that fights back against her is automatically a predator to her. Um, but, like, we also see how fierce and resourceful she is, and I think there's intentional imagery with her out, quote-unquote, hunting food. Um, and, and later, we see her kind of hunting and corralling Shadowstalker. So, yes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely, like... Being inside her head, she doesn't think of herself that way, I don't think. Um, and, and certainly not in any context that involves Sophia, because she still kind of has this bully victim complex there. Um, but I think she has evolved into something a bit more um, aggressive and able to justify her own aggression. Yeah, yeah. So Skitter uses pepper spray to cover her retreat, and then she runs. Shadowstalker chases her and shoots at her, but misses. And uh, Skitter almost manages to bait her into running through an electric fence, which may or may not have killed Shadowstalker due to how her power interacts with electricity. Continuing to flee, Skitter uses swarm clones to misdirect Shadowstalker. There's those things that we said in Arc 8 that would be really useful, and here, here they are, and they're really useful. Um, yeah. So I think the really interesting thing is, like, how did Taylor know about the electricity weakness? Did she even know or she was she just making like an educated guess? And you can kind of what we know about Taylor. She probably just reasoned that that would be effective in some way and went for it. Yeah, I'm not sure. So Shadowstalker finally catches Skitter and tries to cut her throat with the arrowhead. Um, note that up to this point, Skitter hasn't said a word. Yeah, I love that. Um and, and it makes you think back to the earlier Skitter fights when you're in her head. How often does she actually talk? And it's not very often. And yeah. how fucking creepy is that? Yeah. Um, also, in this moment, like, if she hadn't been wearing the spider, super, spider silk suit, like, Shadowstalker literally would have just fucking killed her. Yeah. Um, she literally slashes her throat, but the suit protects her from it. Yeah, right. And then, of course... We finally get our answer, Scott. The answer we've been waiting for all this time. Uh... Shadow Stalker is plunged into darkness. And at this moment, we breathe a big sigh of relief. Because remember, as far as we know, Skitter has been acting as a solo agent. But not but anymore. Not anymore. The other undersiders. Right. That's right. That's right, kind Scott. Of. You're you're always right about everything. And <laughs> the ones you aren't right about, we just delete we those. We ignore those. Yep. Those, you didn't say that. Um, so the undersiders awesomely step out of the shadows plus a new member with a horned helmet um and they use their various powers to weaken and incapacitate her in just the most delicious revenge beatdown that i ever experienced and yeah. then skitter finishes off by uh shadow soccer says oh so it was all it was all a ruse huh it was all a ruse that you were breaking up with the undersiders and and Skitter responds with her like bug enhanced voice. No, things are different now. And then tasers her out. Um, and then the undersiders grab Shadowstalker and carry her away physically. Holy shit. 
This is crazy. Yes. It's so scary. Like, yes. it's so ominous. And like, it's such a wonderful way to end the chapter because it's so scary because like we haven't been with this character the whole time. And we've been with these people that we really actually grow to like it with the exception of Sophia fucker. Um, and then we just, just holy shit, she's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I almost wonder if this is one of those scenes that that Waldo had in his head and worked his way toward just because it's so it's such a perfect like emotional climax and it gives you the the catharsis that you want basically you've I mean how long have we, have we been wanting Sophia to get some kind of comeuppance and yeah this is like we're like ah oh, yes so absolutely so Scott what are they going to do with her oh boy um so I'm still pretty convinced that my speculation about the undersiders being done with like petty crimes, um, this, this theft of food, notwithstanding, um, and are working on refocusing their efforts on taking down, um, the perceived corruption within the authority system of the protectorate. Um, I still think that's correct. Um, and with that said, uh, capturing a ward would certainly be an interesting tool to either bargain for, or infiltrate somehow the PRT um, and take them down from the inside. And that's kind of what I feel this is. Um, that's my guess. Okay. So what do you think the current situation is with vis-a-vis -vis Taylor and the Undersiders? So my guess here is that Lisa managed to convince Taylor to join the Undersiders again, and also using um, her natural uh, gifts as a... Uh, uh, and, and maybe a little bit of her power um, to kind of smooth things over with everyone. Um, I think they were probably pretty reluctant to take her back in. I think Rachel was probably the most reluctant and their friendship might not be in a good place for now. But I think uh, once Gru fell in line, everyone else does. Um, but I think that the deal to get Taylor back in was to change up the plan and do this thing. I'm still pretty confident on this to try to take the, the corruption inside the protectorate down um, uh, maybe allying with coil to do this as part of coil's plan and then once that's done then try to take down coil from the inside um, i think brian's still probably the de facto leader um, but i still think that's going to change here pretty soon um, and that's that's all i got yeah yeah i think that's probably similar to where i was uh, at about this point so yeah and then finally uh user uh Man, my eyes are going. Uh, Viraltis, Viraltis, Viraltis. Close enough. Close enough. Su suggested that I ask you. Uh, the next arc is called Parasite, and we have seen that, that you can sort of interpret the arc names as meaning something in in the chapter. You know, in context of what's happening in them. So, what what do you think Parasite could mean? So this is. I like this idea of doing this each week. So we should do this each week as we finish our episode. Um, as far as arc 10, I've been toying with this idea in my head and I'm not ready to, um, formally declare it and put it on my spreadsheet, but that the thing that has seeded everyone is some kind of parasite. Um, I, I really like this idea cause it could like mean that Taylor eventually learns how to control the parasites and then how to control other people's powers, which just seems crazy awesome. And it seems like it would be a really fun thing to do. Like I said, I'm not uh, sure I'm ready to declare that officially yet. So my guess for the parasite in this, um, it refers to chariots infiltration of the wards. And I think the undersiders are still officially working for coil. Um, and so the combination of chariot being entered in the ward and this kidnap shadow stalker leverage combo, um, could be the main focus of arc 10. And, and as, as they're kind of the parasite, uh, as they worm uh, their way into the organization. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, that latter that latter interpretation was was definitely closer to where my mind was because I was like, oh, they're they're um they're they're infiltrating. I was sort of viewing it as 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 meaning something similar to an infiltrator. Yeah, um, I, do, I do like your I do like your powers theory. That's that's got to go on the on the ledger there. Oh no, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Well, you, you, no, you I'll, take I'll, your time. No, it's fine. I'll put it there. It's fine. Take your time. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's that's really a left field kind of thing. Um, but it, it was fun. So I like, I like how, how it could, uh, like synergize with, with Taylor's power. I think that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So yeah, any, any final thoughts to wrap up, um, this arc? Yeah. So, so w when I was reading, 
Um, I noticed very much this comparison, and we talked about it kind of already, this comparison between Shadowstalker um, within her chapter and Taylor um, and kind of mindset and, and this, this idea that Shadowstalker could be a, a Taylor that's far gone. And with this in mind, as I was rereading the chapter, I kind of noticed that each, um, each trait of these six people we move through kind of mirror a trait of Taylor's. Um, with Weld, we see the, the leadership. With Flechette, we see compassion. Clockblocker has anger. Kidwin has doubt. Um, Vista has this this well of despair that eventually leads to her gaining strength. And Shadowstalker seems to be in the midst of deep compartmentalization and denial. Um, and I think this is really fascinating as you look how these people are uh, using those traits to um, become better people or in Shadowstalker's worse. Um, and I think, I think that really, that just ties in so thematically and it makes to me this arc even more important because we're seeing all these traits in different people and how they're dealing with it. And we can see that as compared with Taylor and, and she kind of has all these things in one. Um, and it's just really, really interesting. And I really, I really like that idea. Yeah, no, I, I love that too. I, I definitely didn't, didn't think of it that way, but yeah, you, when, when you highlight the aspects of her character that way those are the different parts of her that tend to war amongst themselves. And, uh, and, and she kind of goes in and out of the different uh, phases of those different aspects of herself at different times. Yeah. And then, th th then this crazy thing happened where this thing, like, this train of thought that I was in, like, as I, when I wrote those down, it led me to this, this new line of thought, which is like throughout arc nine, we're, we're seeing the different members of the wards and they were seeing them as like representations for the stages of grief because everyone in this group with a couple exceptions is dealing with the loss of members of their group of their family. Um, and if you can look at each of them and you can look at them as like the five stages of grief, um, you can look at Weld and see denial in the fact that he's not even acknowledging that these people are dead. Um, you can see anger in clock blocker. You can see kind of bargaining and kid win. Why wasn't I better? Why wasn't I more powerful? Um, Vista, you see depression and in Shadowstalker, you see this kind of weird version of acceptance where she's just over it and doesn't care. Um, and I, like that is fascinating to me. And the only one that doesn't fit into this is Flechette. Um, but she's kind of a temporary, so I'm not counting her. Um, yeah, yeah. She she didn't experience the loss the way they right. did. I think. Yeah. And I just I love this. Like, and and this is one of those things that could be intentional. Um, could have been Wildbow's master plan for the arc, but very likely could not have and it just kind of felt into this neatly and i just love it so much i love this train of thought i love this idea that we're seeing how these characters deal with grief and 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 like i said each one of them gets to a point where they've started to be okay with it um except for shadow stalker like clock blocker gets to a point where he's starting to become more of himself he's getting along with weld more um weld is realizing that people lost and, and reaching out to them. Kidwin is is starting to get a little confidence. Vista has found her role. Um, and we're seeing these people deal with the loss and, and start to move on. And I think that's really powerful and I really love it. Yeah, I think whether or not it was Wildbo intentionally using the five stages of grief for his structure, it is clear that each of these characters is dealing with their grief in very different ways. And I mean, when when you map out the space of human emotions that's probably going to look something like the different yeah the different yeah. points on on, on the, the grief yeah and, cycle. and i mean like the five stages of grief are kind of over referenced and overused in general um honestly everyone deals with grief differently so to, you can't can't force people into one thing but yeah um they they kind of work like like the the hero's journey or the three-act structure that we talked about last week they work because they're broad um, and fit into most people's emotional states in some way. But I, I just love that idea, and I love how it thematically ties into this aftermath of death chapter that we, or arc that we have here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I, I love this arc like you do. Um, I, I think I, it's, I really regret giving it short shrift the first time I read through because I was like eager to find out. I was like eager to get back with Taylor. And uh, I'm, if anything, this project is highlighting to me some deficiencies in how I approach books in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I need to be a lot like slower and, and more thoughtful and and think about things more deeply. Um, yeah, I, I was eager to get back to her, too. And I think that's the, the a testament to how well this was written is that 
I think the beginning of Weld's chapter, I was kind of annoyed because I'm like, oh, where's Taylor? I want Taylor. And then by the end of it, I was just I was just along for the ride and I was just in it with this. And I just I loved every minute of it. Totally. And I don't know if Wild Bill explicitly sets himself up writing challenges like this, but um, this to me felt like he was like, now I'm going to approach this by by basically taking these characters who are the the enemy of my main character and humanizing and making them all very sympathetic and uh and and thereby also fleshing out the world and and deepening your attachment to the story yeah yeah so that's uh that was a fantastic arc and uh i'm looking forward to see how things evolve of course but uh before we wrap up scott let's go into your speculations all right so i've got another two this week um i had someone i saw someone asked and talked about like you shouldn't just do two a week i don't specifically set out to do two a week i do as many as i think of a week and it just happens to have been two for the last few weeks. Um, this isn't counting the ones that you pinned on me during the talk, um, and, and we might have to add those in after. I don't remember. Seven. Yeah, I don't remember them all off the top of my head right now. But the two I have specifically written down here for, um, after learning a bit about how the cape trigger events and when they trigger near each other, how it affects their powers and how their powers interact with each other, I'm gonna say that in some way, shape, or form, Sophia and Brian. Um, triggered at the same time in a similar place. And that's kind of why their powers seem to almost uh, Brian's kind of cancels hers out. And, and it leads to this natural um, like uh, uh, competition between the two of them. I, I like that idea. And I think we got a little hint of that uh, in this chapter. So that's my first one. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, my second one is that Flechette um, is going to leave the wards eventually because she wants to hang out with uh, Parian. Is that why we decided it was going to That's pretty- how I'm saying it. All right. Um, because they are going to fall in love. Um, All right. These are, these are beautiful, Scott. Yeah. As usual. Each of them a gem. <laughs> and then, of course... Um, while I'm going back and editing and tomorrow, I will listen to all the ones that you declared my speculations <laughs> and we will try to add those to, uh, to the, the Excel sheet as well. Um, I'm kind of thinking maybe, maybe the smart thing to do instead of having this as like a section at the end, just call them out throughout the episode. Um, and then just like do it that way. Maybe that's better and, and more smooth instead of having a, a defined section for that. But we can, we can talk about that later. Yeah, I think if if that feels organic, we can probably do it yeah. that way. All right. Well, yeah, that that was that was fantastic. Um, yeah, that wraps up Arc Nine Sentinel. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com, or you can follow us on Twitter at gotwormpod. Um, friendly reminder that we're doing our my live reaction via that Twitter, so if you want to see that, um, that's where you can follow us. My personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, and Matt's is at moredenimail. Um, you should follow us. We talk about a lot of various things. Matt's tweets often make me laugh because they're just so random. <laughs> I'll just catch one and just burst out laughing. Um, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Overcast now, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. Friendly reminder that today's episode is the last one that we will be posting on the old Daily Planet podcast feed. As of next week, if you want Worm, subscribe to We've Got Worm individually. Yeah, and you can always find this, any other podcast we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. We've hit our first goal, uh, but we've got a lot of other fun things planned, including a fan art competition for actual cash prizes, uh, the return of the Daily Planet book club in the future. And uh, where we will be tacking, uh, tackling other non wild bow novels of your choice and more. Check it out and please donate whatever you can spare. 
Yeah, and if you're one of those that can't spare any extra cash, we do understand, but there are tons of ways to still help us out. If you are listening via iTunes, like we've said many times before, if you could take a minute to rate and review the We've Got Worm podcast. Um, we saw a bunch of you did this last week. We've got like a, a bunch of new reviews, and they're all really great. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing that. Um, if you haven't done it yet, if you could please take a minute to do that, that would be so helpful. But we really, really appreciate that. Um, you could also just share the podcast with your friends. Um, it's a great excuse to like get someone else into the series like Matt did with me. Or if you have friends that are just as obsessed with this thing as you are, maybe they want to listen to us talk about it. Yeah, nothing tickles me more than hearing that someone has gotten into Worm because of our podcast. That was honestly not something that I expected to happen when we started this project. Yeah, I know a, a few people, actually. A few of my yeah. friends. Um, one of our frequent podcast guests, James Gentry, who was on our Daily Planet podcast last week, is reading the book now because of this. Um, so that's is, awesome. Yeah, I'm so happy. So yeah, so uh, tune in next week to hear us talk about Arctan Parasite, which I am very much looking forward to. Me Until next time. Too. Bye-bye. Matt, that took two hours and 15 minutes, and it was like one of the <laughs> shortest arcs we've ever read. I cannot believe we took that much time on that arc. What the fuck is wrong with that? It's ridiculous.